What is up, everybody? We are starting in two minutes, and we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, we're just waiting for a couple of people to chime in, and we will go and get it going. All right, two minutes. We'll be right back. <laughs> Okay, everybody, I think it's about that time. 5.59, we'll get started as soon as it hits six. I'm going to fix this up real quick. All right, it is six o'clock on the dot, guys. I want to welcome everybody to the hashtag Corona Puppy Seminar. My name is Brent Labrada. Uh, I'm a dog trainer. I've been doing this for about 12 years. We've trained over probably a, literally a thousand puppies. Uh, so we can't wait to bring this information to you guys. Um, uh, there's a, a lot of things going on right now, as you guys know, with the coronavirus. Um, what I've noticed, though, that the, the positive of this is that a lot of us have been able to spend time with our dogs. And what we've noticed is that there's a pattern. People who didn't have a dog before are bringing in new dogs into their family because now we have the time to raise them uh, to, you know, to, to, to just in, bring in a new family member. Now, whether that is a new puppy that you are raising for the first time, uh, whether it's a dog you just adopted who might be a little bit older, um, or maybe you're just fostering a dog because now you want to give back or you want to kind of maybe beta test what it's like to have a dog. Um, we designed this particular seminar for you guys. All right. Um, I can't explain how many, how, just how important these first couple weeks of owning a new dog are. They really will lay down the foundation uh, for the rest of your success, right? Any habit that your dog learns in the first couple weeks of your ownership um, will affect the rest of their life, right? Um, and so what we want to do is we want to kick this off, get you guys to a really good head start. Um, I want to introduce a special little friend. This is our baby. This is Maya. She's three and a half months old. She's a little morky. So that's a half Maltese, half Yorkie. Um, she's going to be our little canine talent a little bit later. Uh, but I just want to introduce you guys to her because uh, we're going to be doing some obedience work with her and then also with you guys. So we can't wait for you to show that off with you. But before all that, let's go ahead and go over some of the what we're going to talk about in this seminar. OK, uh, here you go. Could you take her away for me? Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Awesome, awesome, awesome. OK. So a couple of things that we're going to be going over. The main issues that we see uh, in puppy ownership, we're going to see uh, potty training. Um, it's not that good, right? We're going to see that the dog's independence training, the ability to be alone or separated from us. Um, they don't have certain hobbies and habits that they do on their own. So we want to teach you guys how to develop those things as well. Uh, also, one of the most, one of the most I think, uh, concerning issues that people run into is biting. Right. How many of you guys, your dogs just bite the heck out of you? They bite your arms. They bite your pant legs. Uh, you could be asleep and they come and grab your shoelace and start tugging on it. So we're going to talk all about these different behaviors and give you guys practical solutions on how to deal with them. Um, we are you guys may have you know heard or read some YouTube, you know, watched some YouTube videos, read some books, saw some articles. My job as a dog trainer for you guys is to try and give you the complete picture. Right. Unfortunately, when we watch one video or this video or that video, it is so easy to have an information overload and get confused um, that, you know, so many times people call me and they go, you know, I've tried this video. I've tried this technique. I've tried that trainer. I've tried this, 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 this. And the problem is, is uh, YouTube is great. Videos are great. Articles are great. The only problem is that they're incomplete. And so what we want to try and provide you guys today um, are some general practices. Uh, some very effective training techniques and ideas that are going to help you guys uh, get your dogs on the right track. 
Okay. So first, let's go ahead and go over potty training. Um, I was a high percentage of people dealing with potty training. Um, and there's a couple ways about go going about it. Um, first couple things I want to talk to you guys about. Uh, always I get calls that either the dog is pooping or peeing too much, right? And I literally had a call this morning about pooping and peeing too much. Pooping and peeing too much is a very, very simple solution. This means that our dog's consumption of food is either too much for their body size, or it means that their water intake is too much for their bladder size, right? So if we have a dog who is constantly pooping throughout the house, that tells me already that they have too much food in their system. Um, if we have a dog who is peeing every 20 minutes, that tells me that that dog has what I call a drinking problem, right? So um, a drinking problem just means that the dog drinks, 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 drinks too much water. And just kind of as we learned over time, whether we were a kid drinking too much soda uh, or you were having a night out with your friends at the bar, as soon as you break that seal, you're going to have to pee about every 20 to 30 minutes until your body balances everything out. So the first two things that we want to talk about is we want to talk about uh, meal portions and we want to talk about water regulation. I think that in and of itself is just a huge game changer for a lot of people because I can't explain how many times I, uh, you know, I'm talking to people and, um, you know, they're, they're confused. They're confused that the dog shouldn't eat a whole bowl of food. Um, and usually the answer I get is that the dog was hungry. Um, so dogs will be hungry. Babies are super hungry all the time. However, it just doesn't mean we should shove them with food. I did have a client many, many years ago. He was an English bulldog puppy. He was about 10 weeks old, 11 weeks old. Um, and he told me, he goes, my dog is pooping 10 times a day. And automatically, I'm like, I already know what's happening. So when I go to his house, um, he shows me, I go, so how much do you feed him? And he goes, like a bowl full. And I go, a bowl full? And he goes, yeah. And he had this big, giant tin bowl that was about this wide, this deep. And he would fill it up with kibble. And that freaking bulldog would just eat the whole thing. And I said, why are you feeding him so much? And he goes, because he's hungry. Right. So this idea happens a lot in, 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 in dog training and in puppy raising. Um, you know, I come personally from a family where, you know, the kids never ate too enough. Right. So I'd ask my mom for a little tiny portion because I was only kind of hungry and she'd pile on a whole plate. Right. Uh, maybe it's having immigrant moms. Right. Maybe that's what that is. Uh, but the whole idea here is, is we want to be able to give dogs the proper portion so that their body can handle it so that we can better predict pooping and peeing. Right. So. Um, depending on the breed of the dog, uh, again, there's, there's, this isn't a perfect science, but what we want to look at, um, if I have a dog, let's say I had a Labrador retriever puppy, right? And he was about eight weeks to 10 weeks. Uh, we're, we're probably looking somewhere around half a cup to three quarters of food, uh, depending on the size of that dog, right? If I have like a little, uh, like a little Morky, like, um, like the baby that I had earlier, we're looking at anywhere between like a eighth to maybe a quarter cup of food per meal. Now, here's the other thing. We got to make sure that we are scheduling feedings as well. Okay. Another common problem that we see regularly is that people will either leave the food out and let the dog eat it. Right. And I totally understand why people do that because maybe that's what their older dogs do. Right. Or maybe that's what their dogs that they, that did when they were kids, their dogs free fed. Uh, but just remember free feeding is not it doesn't allow us to teach the dogs or have predictable bowel movements. So we, we have to completely eliminate that, you know, in our schedule, if we want to be able to teach our dogs to poop and pee on certain areas. So that's really, really important. Okay. Now, number two, um, if we are looking at, um, so we have portion control, uh, then what we want to do is we want to make sure we're feeding our dogs a minimum three times a day. OK, uh, now, why three times a day and not two times a day? Uh, because the dog's body needs to be able to take as much nutrients as they possibly can. The same reason a baby might take multiple bottles per day is because you can't just give the baby one giant bottle because they're physically not big enough to hold it. Right. So we want to give our dogs up to three meals a day. What I like to do, we go ahead and do a breakfast. Right. Usually sometime between 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. Right. Dogs usually wake up at six. Um, and then we also do about a lunchtime somewhere around noon, midday, uh, 12, one o'clock. Uh, and then we'll usually do dinner just a few hours later, around five o'clock, six o'clock. OK, now this spacing, what it allows us to do, it allows us to make sure we have enough time for the dog to digest the food, process the food, 
take a nap in between, of course. Um, but most importantly, at nighttime, we wanna make sure our dogs can eliminate poop and pee before we actually go to bed, right? So that's, that's so, so important. Um, so usually a five to six o'clock dinner time in my book has worked wonderfully. Sometimes if you feed a little bit too late, seven o'clock, if you go to bed around 10 or 11, you most likely will get woken up with a puppy who wants to poop or pee in the middle of the night. Okay. So that's food regulation. We want to make sure we are doing, uh, proper portions. That's important. Uh, we also want to make sure we are doing uh, proper scheduled feedings. So don't leave the food out. Okay. Now, some people might ask, they might go, okay, so what do I do um, if my puppy's not eating his food? Right? What, do, what do I do? How, do? how do I schedule the feeding? Because a lot of time that is the reason why people leave the bowls out. What we have to do is we have to, we have to take a couple things into consideration. When you guys first get a puppy, it is not uncommon for the first day or two that your dog's appetite is off. Okay. Your dogs are usually going through what's called transitional stress. Now, those of you who've gotten a rescue dog who could be a year old, two years old, three years old, four years old, this is also the same. So in this scenario, what we're doing for puppies is actually something that we really want to do for rescue dogs also. So if you have a new foster or if you have a new uh, adopted adoption dog, that's actually going to be a member of your family. We want to make sure that those dogs um, have a structured meal. Okay. Um, and it's only because we want to be able to teach them a bunch of other stuff downstream. So keep this in mind. Water regulation will control pee accidents, food portion control and scheduled feedings will allow us to predict when the dog has to go potty. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and, and, and look at that. Um, ideally we want our dogs to poop and pee, um, close to the amount of times they eat plus or minus one, right? So let's say my dog eats, uh, three times a day. If my dog poops four times a day, that's totally normal. If I, my dog eats three times a day and my dog's pooping six times a day, that's telling me it's a lot of food, a lot, a lot of food. Okay. Now there are going to be some exceptions. So let's say maybe you guys have the dog on the wrong food. The dog may not be taking on weight. Um, you know, they, they're going to make exceptions with wet foods and different additives that you can add to add more calories into the meal. Uh, but for the most part, we want to make sure that those three things are there. So I'm going to go ahead and go over to my drawing board. I just want to give you guys a visual so that way we can, uh, for our next lesson, what we're trying to predict. Here we go. Dun, da, da, dum. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. So when we are looking at the day, I'm going to go ahead and draw out uh, a di a timeline of the day. Okay. So we have here. All right. So this is usually when the dog wakes up. So W U wake up. This is bedtime. Okay, bedtime. And this is, um, let's say this is noon. Okay, so we have our wake up time, we have noon, which is midday, and then we have our bedtime, which is way over there. Okay, now this is not developed to scale, so this is just a visual representation of what we're trying to do here. Uh, let me see if I can get a little closer for you guys. Let's go up. Okay, so this is, uh, this is wake up, the dog midday, and this is bedtime. That's what that stands for. So usually, on average, dogs will wake up usually with the sun. So right now, this time, it's anywhere between 6 to 7 o'clock. Dogs will usually wake up naturally. As the sun is on its way up, dogs will get a burst of energy. This is what's called their uh, circadian rhythm. Um, it's also We're going to talk about something called crepuscular behavior down the line. Uh, so we explain another phenomenon that we see with puppies. But let's say the dog wakes up um, right here. Okay, let's say this is 6.30. Let's just say it's 6.30, okay? The first thing that we want to do when puppies come out is we want to give them an opportunity to poop and pee. So poop and pee is always going to be associated with an X. This is an opportunity for the dog to go to the bathroom. Actually, I take that back. Sorry. We're going to put that X. As soon as they wake up, we want that dog to go poop and pee or give them the opportunity to go poop and pee. Okay. Shortly after they go poop and pee, we can give them breakfast. So here, when we do training, we take the dog poop and pee. We immediately serve them breakfast um, because we have to. We have, we have a training regimen we want to do. But usually after this uh, potty, this this first potty, uh, we can feed breakfast. So let's say this is breakfast. Okay. 
Now, what we want to see is we want to see, did my dog poop and pee in this first section here? Or does my dog poop after breakfast? So is my dog an after breakfast pooper, right? So we want to see if my dog poops before a meal or if my dog poops after a meal. Now, this is what we call predicting regularity. Okay, if we can't predict the dog's regularity, we're going to usually be pretty surprised. Very commonly, our dogs are going to poop and pee both as soon as they wake up and they're going to poop and pee after breakfast. We'll explain that a little bit later. But the most important thing we want to figure out is pooping. When is the dog pooping? Okay, so if the dog poops first thing in the morning, great. If the dog poops um, after breakfast, we need to see which one is the most common. And this will give us a little bit of an idea of how regular the dog is. Now, if our dogs poop before breakfast is served, there's usually going to be a two to three hour, two to three hour window where the dog does not have to go poop. But the dog will definitely have to pee. So keep that in mind. If the dog is an after breakfast pooper or peer, then oh, now you know, usually a short term after breakfast, the dog's going to have to go to the pot. pot. All right. So this window right here is usually about 15 to 20 minutes. Okay. Between here and here. Okay. Between breakfast being served, we want to teach our dogs to hold it. Um, and then we give them an opportunity to 15 to 20 minutes later to go potty. I'm just going to move this over here just so it's a little bit more to scale. Okay. This makes sense so far. Okay. Let's see if there's any questions. If you guys have any questions, go ahead and throw them up and I'll answer them live for you. But I want you guys to just understand this part first. So poop and pee first thing in the morning, serve the dog breakfast, 15 to 20 minutes later, let the dog go poop and pee again, okay? If the dog poops before breakfast, there's, the dog usually won't poop again until about here. Usually, oh, sorry, over here, closer to noon, okay? So let's say this was 6.30. Let's say you gave breakfast at 7 a.m. Let's say you take the dog out you know, right here at 7.20, all right? The dog should be empty at this time, all right? If the dog was pooped already, the dog won't poop closer to 10 or 11, 10 or 11, okay? So this is something I want you guys to keep in mind. I do apologize, I'm not an artist, but I just hope you guys get a, a visual representation of this, okay? So this is our first potty event. This is what we're trying to look at, okay? The dog woke up. We fed the dog, or we pooped and peed the dog. We fed the dog a meal. We waited for the dog to digest it and have another bowel movement. After the second bowel movement, this area is usually going to be free time. And we're going to talk about free time a little bit later. But this is uh, right here. This area is a play and freedom time. I have horrible handwriting. So sorry. Okay, so this is what we want to do now. What we're going to see is we're going to do breakfast, we're going to do lunch, the same exact uh, potty event we want to happen around noon, and the same exact potty event we want to happen over here at dinner, right? So if I have dinner right here, uh, we're going to see if the dog poops before dinner or after dinner. Uh, we're going to see that that's going to be a consistent pattern with our dogs. Okay, if the dog is pooping before dinner, you know, two to three hours later, the dog is going to have to poop. After his dinner, if the dog doesn't poop before dinner, the dog's gonna poop somewhere over here, okay? Uh, this, we're gonna talk specific, a little bit more specifics later, but this is the idea, one poop event, two poop events, three poop event before bedtime, and then we're able to see that the dog is able to go to bed and hopefully sleep the whole night. And we'll go ahead and talk about that in more detail, all right? So let's go ahead and talk about a couple other things. Dun, 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 dun. I hope that was helpful. I did my best on that one. Okay. Um, now, what we're going to see is, is teaching our dogs to hold it. This is another part of potty training. Um, there, is a, there are a lot of ideas, and I want you guys to wrap your head around, in essence, what potty training is. Um, potty training, we have to uh, kind of predict and anticipate our dog's bowel movements. Um, and then the second thing that we have to do is we have to gradually teach them to strengthen their ability to hold it. Okay. Uh, one method that is really common online is, um, you know, grab a leash, put the dog on the leash, tie the leash to you and take the dog out with a high level of frequency. 
right? And usually what we see, the big issue with this is if the dog has an owner there to constantly take the dog out, we see that the dog actually never really learns to hold themselves, right? Um, and so sometimes we can see an error um, where the dog you know, doesn't know how to hold it when someone is gone. Right. It's great for developing if someone is home all the time to teach the dog to go to that person and be like, hey, mom, I have to go potty. Please take me potty. But it's not helpful if uh, you guys go to work and you want to leave the dog there. Right. Um, so we want to we, we, I like to teach more of the, the gradual strengthening of holding it. And the best way that I like to do that is with confinement work um, or what we call den training. So we're going to go over den training uh, right after this module is done. OK. Um, but we want to be able to see how long we, our dogs can hold it. So if my dog eats a meal, does it take 10 minutes before he has to potty? Does it take 15 minutes? Does it take 20 minutes? Does it take 45 minutes? This is something we have to figure out for our personal dog. And once you figure out that interval, that becomes a baseline. I remember when I first got my puppy dynamite, when he was really, really small, he was eight weeks old, he could only hold it for 10 minutes in the crate, right? Or in the, his puppy pen even. Um, so I knew as soon as I fed him within 10 minutes, I'd take him to his area. He'd go potty. And that's that. Now I can leave my dog alone for four hours and he doesn't have one accident in the house. OK, so it, it builds up gradually as the dog gets older. Part of it is biology and part of it is what we teach them as well. OK, so let's keep that in mind. Um, last thing we want to talk about in potty training. Does your dog have one consistent toilet? Right? If we really want to maximize potty training, we have to create one consistent toilet. A lot of times what happens is sometimes we might have the idea that we want the dog to poop and pee on the walk. Or we might have the idea that we, you know, we want the dog to go on grass. But the problem is, is I live on the third story of an apartment, um, but I don't want to teach my dog wee wee pads because somewhere I read that wee wee pads were really, really bad. I'll tell you guys straight up. I lived on the third floor of an apartment with my puppy. Wee pads saved my life, saved my life because there were days that it rained. There were days that it was freezing. And the last thing you want to do when it is raining and it's like 45 degrees outside is go outside and take your dog potty. Right. So um, it is very possible to teach dogs to go on wee wee pads and then transition them to grass or the walk when they're a little bit older. But I am a huge believer that when we're potty training, we have to create a very streamlined process right where my dog hangs out needs to be very close to where my dog goes to the bathroom and they're almost needs to, i need to almost be able to draw a straight line to get there right so that way it's easy for my dog to recognize that's where i go potty over there right nowhere else um so what we want to do is we want to pick a consistent toilet right uh, what i recommend for people who live in apartments if you guys have balconies you guys can create uh, your own types of toilets for dogs easy way to make a toilet would be like uh Let's say you could get like a, like a big tray, like a, like a kitty litter tray, and you could uh, put uh, you know, some real grass in there like sod, and you could teach the dogs to go on that. Um, if you are okay with wee-wee pads, I would create a station outside on my patio that just has wee-wee pads, and my dog only goes out there to use the toilet, um, and that's where we're gonna put them regularly, right? Um, if you want your dog to learn to go on gravel, put gravel in that area, right? But you can teach your dogs to go on potty on different surfaces. Um, there's been even many times we've had to get really creative. I've taught, uh, one of my clients lived on the 16th floor of a downtown high rise. And we had to teach that dog how to poop and pee inside the guest bathroom shower. It was like a stand-up shower, a big square one. And we just propped the door right open. We put grass down in that shower like synthetic grass and all the owner has to do, the dog walks in there, poops and pees, he picks up the poop, he just hoses it down with the nozzle and that's his poop and pee station. So we had to come up with that uh, on the spot with that dog and that was a super effective. I've probably done that five, six times since this client. So it's such a great idea. Um, but the key is, is we want poop and pee to be convenient, right? So that way the accuracy is higher. If we make poop and pee, you know, we have to go down the hall, down the elevator, across the street to that area um then then we're then it just becomes a lot more room for error okay another thing also we have to take a look at is our dog's health right if our puppies are before four weeks old we cannot expose them to a lot of other animals feces for risk of getting sick now we will talk about this a little more in detail uh, when it comes to the socialization module that we're going to talk about but we have to make sure that that is understood 
uh, the dog's health is a factor in this. All right. Uh, so we want to make sure that the dog has a consistent toilet, whatever that consistent toilet is. It could be, you know, the, the grass in your front lawn where no dogs go. It could be a, a wee wee pad um, on your balcony. It could be a wee wee pad off to the side of your kitchen. It could be a, a sod or synthetic grass that you've set up. Whatever works for you guys, just make sure it's consistent and take the dog there every single time he has to tinkle and poop. All right. And then what we're going to do is we're going to do a reward system. OK, so I want you guys to pay attention to this one because reward systems, uh, they do have the ability to go south. All right. So if I have a dog um, who knows where their toilet is and I take them there every time that the dog goes potty, I'm going to go ahead and reward that dog with a treat. We've all probably heard this or thought of this before. Uh, we could say good dog, good girl, good boy. Give them a treat. Um, and uh, we're going to do that for about a week's time. However, I've seen so many times that people do this conditioning wrong where the dog will actually pee on purpose just to get food. So we gotta be kind of careful and I'll tell you how to avoid that next. Um, what I like to do is I'll always tell my clients to, to when they take their dogs to go poop and pee on that spot, right? It could be, it doesn't matter what it is, that toilet. When the dog pees, for the first week, we're gonna give the dog treats for going pee on there. Good dog, treat, 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 treat. OK, we're going to do that for one week. And we're also always going to treat for when the dog poops. Right. And sometimes they happen simultaneously. So the dog poops and pees. We give them treat, 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 treat. We praise them. But after that first week of peeing in that area, we're only going to start treating for poops. OK. And the reason why is a lot of times people will treat the dog for peeing. And on accident, that will sometimes increase peeing inside the house. Or one of the worst ways of practicing this, because I've seen this happen, um, sometimes people will treat their dogs for peeing outside, right? So let's say you would go for a walk, the dog pees on the grass, we go, good girl, and gives the dog food. Then a couple, you know, we walk halfway down the block, the dog pees again, we go, good girl, because in our minds, the dog's not peeing in the house, so it's good. But what happens is if a more, majority of the rewarding is happening anytime the dog pees outside of the house, eventually the dog starts generalizing Oh, they just like it when I squat and pee. Oh, so they put that to memory. And this is how sometimes we can, it can turn south on us. So we are only rewarding dogs for pooping and peeing in the areas that we are designating for them to go poop and pee, right? If the dog poops and pees outside, great. Majority of young puppies are a little too nervous to go poop and pee outside. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But, um, but I want you to focus on teaching the toilet, teaching the toilet. Now, if you guys are having trouble teaching a toilet, Knowing your dog's regularity, like we talked about on the board, is one of the most important things, okay? Because uh, sometimes if we're trying to teach the dog to go on a surface that's foreign to them, uh, because dogs will usually, dogs are attracted to the same surface, so they can learn to go potty on a certain type of surface. Uh, so some dogs you can teach to go on concrete, sometimes it's always grass, sometimes it's always, um, you know, it could be like, like wee-wee pads or things that simulate wee-wee pads. Um, so those are things that the dogs memorize. Dogs will also memorize the location, right? So, you know, let's say on your balcony, you started with wee-wee pads, but then eventually you put in, uh, like a synthetic grass or like a porch potty, right? If you put in that porch potty, the dog will be like, Hey, I got a toilet upgrade, but it's the exact same place that your dog went to the bathroom. Right. Um, and so they memorize location, they memorize surface. And then as most of you guys know, they memorize smell. So if it smells like poop and pee, Sometimes that triggers the instinct to go poop and pee. Um, and if it's the same location, so that's that trifecta, the location, the smell, and the surface. If they're all the same, the dog will learn to poop and pee on that regularly. Okay. Even if you guys moved to a different house, the dog will learn that as well. Okay. Um, all right. Cool. So um, I want to give you guys uh, another tip. So when we're rewarding, after we start rewarding uh, for poops, we're going to do that for about another week or two, rewarding for poops in the right place. Then what we're going to do is we're going to completely get rid of food as a reward, and we're going to give the dog what we call real life rewards. Okay. A lot of people, when they're potty training their dog, uh, I would recommend do not use the walk as your dog's potty area. And this is for rescue dogs. This is for puppies. Reason for it. So many times I see owners walking for 45 minutes, just waiting for their dogs to take a dump, right? And in those 45 minutes, the dog is sniffing stuff, um, you know, peeing, you know, marking trees, 
um, and not paying attention to the owner. So right there, because we're going on a walk in the name of pooping and peeing, we tend to already kind of start off on the wrong foot when it comes to walking properly, paying attention on the walk, obedience out in public, uh, which is its own issue. But what I would do is I would actually kind of make pooping and peeing a prerequisite before starting your walk, right? So if you know your dog's regularity, you could take your dog down to the apartment, stand right there in front of that grass where you've always trained him to go, wait for him to poop and pee. And then instead of giving him a treat, you say, good boy. And now you go for his walk, right? And little by little, what your dog starts learning is if I poop and pee, we get to go on a walk. So this is called a real life reward, something that the dog already looks forward to or wants he gets in exchange for pooping and being in the right place. Okay. And this starts just developing a habit and a pattern. Okay. Um, I always recommend it this way. So that way we can actually focus uh, on our relationship on the walk versus focusing on the dog, you know, pooping and peeing for 45 minutes and not paying attention to us. So that's always going to be my mantra. All right. Uh, and then the last three tips for potty training, this is super important. Uh, if you guys can put these, uh, I call it the magic three. Okay. And they're magic because they're magic for our lives and they're magic keys for your dog, uh, for, for understanding your dog's potty training habits. Uh, a lot of pee habits are going to be as follows. Anytime that your dog naps or sleeps and wakes up, your dog is going to have to go to the bathroom. So napping and sleeping. As soon as the dog wakes up, the dog's going to have to go potty. Okay. Number two, anytime your dog ingests food, right? It could be a handful of treats. It could be a bully stick that they chewed on. It could be their actual meal that you give them in a Kong or a food bowl. When they consume that food, naturally what's going to happen is their stomach's going to expand, especially with kibble, and it's going to put pressure against their bladder. So they're more likely within a very short period of time after eating, going to have to tinkle. So we got to make sure that we get that, uh, get that memorized. So if I gave my dog a handful of treats, if my dog just had a bully stick, um, anytime my dog consumes something, make sure you take the dog out to go potty. Okay. Now, number three is going to be anytime that the dog is playing or exercising. Now this tends to be a byproduct of playing and exercising that the dog has to pee. So usually before play dogs might drink a lot of water or after play dogs might drink a lot of water. But also what happens is when the dog's body's moving around, things are kind of mushing up in there. And so anytime that we see our dog zooming around the house for a little bit too long, let's say 10 minutes, uh, let's go ahead and stop them and let's go ahead and let them go outside to go potty real quick. As soon as they go potty, let's bring them back into the house. So a majority of pee accidents usually happen when the dog is playing, all right? They're running around and then all of a sudden the dog squats and goes, uh oh, oops. And then we scream and yell and all that stuff. All right. So just keep that in mind. So let's go ahead and do a little bit of a checklist. Yes, I made this for you guys. So this is a potty training checklist. Uh, number one, make sure scheduled and proportioned meals. All right. And also ask yourself the question, is my dog eating all of their food? All right. This is very, very important. If you can answer yes to this, check it off. Um, it, am I regulating the dog's water? Okay. So let's talk a little tip about water regulation. Um, if your dog is drinking, it has a ferocious water appetite, right? Where they're just glop, 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 glop. I really want you guys to put focus on maybe just putting like a number limit, like of seconds in your head. So you could be like, okay, my dog drinks for seven seconds, whatever your favorite number is at a, under 10, right? Seven seconds. My dog's going to drink for seven seconds, eight seconds, nine seconds, but then you cut the dog off for water. Okay, a lot of times we're scared that dogs will get dehydrated, but I want you guys to know that your dog's gonna have lots of little sips throughout the day, which eventually will, which will keep the dog very healthy and hydrated. We just don't wanna overload the dog system where they pee indiscriminately all over, okay? So here we go. So regulating water. Now we have to also have to know how long our dogs can hold it, all right? So is it 10 minutes, 15 minutes? Um, after they poop, how long is that interval before they have to pee again? Sometimes it's one hour, sometimes it's an hour and a half, sometimes it's two hours. We got to do this research and sometimes it is trial and error, guys. Okay. A good little rule of thumb, um, dogs, dogs under, uh, dogs under, uh, under four months, dogs around eight weeks to 12 weeks can hold it about an hour. Okay. Dogs older than that can hold it an hour and a half to two hours. So that's what I would say. So up to four months, I would say. Um, all right. And then the last one is 
do we have a consistent toilet? Are we rewarding with a treat? And then a week later, reward with real life rewards. Okay, remember these two, three magic tips. Um, nap times and sleep is when the dogs are gonna have to go to the bathroom. Um, also when after the dog eats, and then also after the dog plays and does exercise, they're gonna have to go to the bathroom again. Okay, the key to your dog's success, guys, is your vigilance. And there's no better time than right now to be so vigilant with your dog. All right. Um, I want you guys to almost be able to predict the pooping and peeing. I want you guys to anticipate them and I want you guys to be so good at it. The only way you do, you have to anticipate the behavior that'll lead to your success. Okay. Um, a lot of times people will ask, okay, what do I do if the dog is, uh, uh, if I catch the dog in the act pooping and peeing in front of me? Usually it was your mistake, but the only thing that we can do in that moment is try and get the dog to freeze up so we can put them in the right place. So instead of screaming and trying to scold your dog, what you can do is surprise your dog, right? You can go, hey, the dog goes, huh, what happened? And then you pick the dog up really quick and you move them, but you're not trying to punish them. Don't grab them and rub their nose in it. Don't swat at them. Don't do anything like that because the studies have shown that if you actually reprimand your dog mean or aggressively during potty, dogs will actually start showing a behavior where they think that you're, that you don't like the act of them pooping and peeing, which scares them because they don't have control over it yet. Right? So it's like, I can't control this, but they hate it. So what ends up happening is dogs actually learn to not poop and pee in front of humans, but this doesn't teach them to poop and pee on their right area. So what, what the end result is, is these dogs will learn to poop and pee behind the couch where you can't see them, or they'll go down the hall to the bathroom that no one uses and poop and pee in there because they don't want you to visually see them because they don't want to get in trouble, right? So um, try not to scream and yell at your dog for pooping and pee in the wrong place because if they do, it was your fault. You should scream at yourself or scream at your husband, but definitely not at your puppy, all right? So this is our potty training module. One more time. This is our checklist. There you go. All right. Any questions that you guys have right now on potty training that I can answer before I move on to the next module, go ahead and type them in. We'll spend about three to five minutes on this. Um, and I just want to clarify anything that you guys might have. All right. I'll just wait right here. This is not a Moscow mule. It's water. I wish it was a Moscow mule. That'd be great. Okay. All right. Coming from DBSK Lover. DBSK Lover 22. Uh, what do you do if your puppy already had the accident without you knowing? You blame yourself. That's what you do. Um, we missed something. Usually that means, right? We, we missed, uh, you know, it's, you missed the window. Um, and there's really nothing you can do. What I would recommend is don't let your dog see you clean it up, right? This is some old school method, uh, that my mentor taught me, but I've noticed that if a dog sees you clean up their stool in front of them, then that's even more of a reason for them to go there. Right. Um, so hey, what do you do if you probably already had the accident without you knowing, yeah, if they already had the accident, then that means we missed something. So you first you have to kind of troubleshoot. Was it poop? Was it pee? If it's poop, then that just means you missed the window that he normally has to go. If it's pee, then it was a water regulation thing. Every now and then we'll see that dogs sometimes uh, drink too much water, maybe because our backs were turned or we just couldn't regulate it at that time. Or we thought the dog peed outside, but in essence, they were too busy chasing butterflies or they were insecure and they didn't bother going outside that they come back inside the house where they're comfortable or on or not distracted and they go potty. So sometimes that happens as well. Um, so just keep that in mind. We want to find that error. If you have any questions, just you can call me, email me anytime. Um, and I'll answer that question. If you've tried your best to figure it out and then let me know, Brent, I've tried to figure it out. It's not working. I'll help you out. Hey, Brittany. Okay. What if your work hours aren't consistent to have a schedule, then we have to create areas uh, where the dog, um, uh, where the dog can, has access to go potty on their own. Right. So this is where sometimes people have setups where they leave the sliding glass door open, um, or they create a dog run on the side of the house, 
uh, where the dog has access to it, maybe from the laundry room or the kitchen. Um, sometimes we just have to be creative depending on the size of the dog. It can affect whether we are actually doing, um, you know, uh, wee wee pads or some type of indoor setup for pooping and peeing. Um, so it's a, it's, it's not an easy question, uh, but we'd have to kind of know what your setup at the house is like and we'd be able to give you better, better answers. Let's see, Mallory Woodley, our puppy runs away from us when we need to pick her up. How can we get her not to do that? Well, that's actually a good obedience question. I'm gonna bring that up in the obedience module. That's gonna be really, really important. Um, so, uh, but great question. And I think a lot of people probably are running through that, right? Um, the dogs become kind of grab shy where you reach for them and they go, ha, ha, juke you out, right? So we're gonna work on that. Puppy does an empty bladder when they potty the first time. So you don't know if she is done or not to bring back inside. Um, good question, Susan. Um, puppy does it. So sometimes if you know that that's the case, then that means we just have to stay outside longer, right? Until the, until we get that dog regular. Now here's, oh, here's another tip I didn't actually mention in the whole spiel that I gave you guys before. Um, anytime my dog leaves confinement, like a crate or a puppy pen or anything like that, give them water. Right. So water is a great trigger for the digestive system. So if the dog gulps down some water right before going potty, they usually will pee and poop a lot faster. Right. Versus on a dry mouth or not drinking any water. Um, it's actually something I learned uh, through my doctor. He said, you know, drink a tall glass of water when you first get up. And I try it with all my dogs and it freaking maximizes their their pooping and their peeing so quick. It's probably too much information. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, but I hope that answered your question. All right. How do you train a fully housebroken dog to potty on the balcony because you want to stay inside because of the coronavirus? Dog is five years old. Good question. Um, Smiley Tail Rescue is asking. Uh, you could teach it to them. Usually, however, if your dog, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a little stressful on the dog, especially if they're already will, really well potty trained. And when I say stressful, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. It just means the dog in their mind might be thinking like, I'm not supposed to poop here. Like I never poop here. I don't want to poop here. I think it's bad or I don't feel comfortable. The same way some humans don't like pooping at work or when they're camping, right? They need a toilet or they need their toilet, right? So sometimes that, that conditioning kicks in. Um, and the first time, if you do want to teach the dog to go on the balcony, sometimes the I wouldn't do it right now. Like I would put a mask on and just take the dog out to go potty on the grass personally. If, if, if I lived in an apartment, um, you know, just put gloves and masks on and go out. Uh, but if it's something that you wanted for long term, um, you know, hopefully this is done really soon, but if this is something you want to do for long term, you're just going to have to wait the dog out. The dog is going to have to hold it, hold it, hold it until the dog cannot hold it anymore until the dog has to have an accident on the balcony now after that first accident and you praise him for it he's gonna go what the f you like this you liked me pooping and peeing right here that's weird but then you do it twice and then you do it three times and little by little you start shaping the new behavior so it's like really a waiting game is what it is all right uh so let's go ahead and go back uh last one can you remind me of the leash we should get for in home training i will go over that in private with you uh, call me later, Mallory. Okay. It's for my dad and mom who are in their eighties. Thanks, Brent. You're welcome. Okay. So we are 43 minutes into this already. Um, and we just did potty training. We got about two more modules to go over. Um, so let's do it. Let's do it. I'm going to go over toys. I think this is one that's going to be really, really appropriate right now. Um, let me go ahead and Let's go ahead and do this set up a little bit different. Shum, shum, shum. All right, guys. So so when we're going over toys, um, not all toys are created equal. Um, they're super commonly like I will go to someone's house and someone has a basket. And in that basket is a bunch of freaking toys, right? Everything from their bones to their squeakers, to their plush toys, to their balls, to their everything. And what happens is um, 
it's kind of a ridiculous way of thinking. It's nice and organized. And it, if you definitely saw that bin at Ikea that you thought this would be perfect for the dog's toys, it, it makes sense to us, but it doesn't make sense in teaching any type of behaviors. Okay. Um, so teaching behaviors, um, I want you guys to think about like, what if your kid, like you had a, a human child and you bought the baseball, a bat, uh, the basketball, a football, um, a tennis racket, some tennis balls, and you put it in a basket and you just left it in your kid's room. That's exactly what we're doing with our dogs when we get a bin of toys. Right. So uh, you have to teach the kid how to use these toys. You have to you have to show them uh, what you're supposed to do and when it's supposed to. In essence, you have to teach them context. So um, a lot of times we're not teaching our dogs context with toys. And this is why a lot of problems occur uh, in regards to, you know, they don't bring the ball back or they're constantly taking plush toys and ripping them apart and taking the squeakers out. Um, they're possessive of toys. So if you've ever seen a dog who like grabs a toy, walks over to the corner and just kind of possesses it like this is mine. Um, it's because we taught them this stuff when they were puppies inadvertently, probably, or by mistake, what we taught it to them. Um, so we're going to go over two types of toys. One thing that I call one player games and another thing that I call two player games. Okay. So let me guys show you guys a couple examples of one player games. Okay. Here we go going on the ground right now okay so uh these are chew toys right so chew toys are usually going to be made of rubber uh nylon um silicone um and there's a couple different types of categories of chew toys we have what are called our our uh food games which is a kong this is a chew toy and this is what we call a dental chew right so dental chews uh this these are dental chews sorry uh dental chew usually has nubs or rivets um i have another toy this is a dental chew also because it has all these different edges and ridges and the whole point of the dental chew stuff um this is perfect for when dogs are teething and mouthing right and and here's a cool thing is even for rescue dogs these toys are extremely important right um, one thing that we see a lot with rescue dogs is they, they have what I called unresolved puppy issues. So a lot of rescue dogs didn't get taught these things that I'm trying to teach you guys to do with your puppies. So when we do have rescues and fosters, let's go ahead and teach them these things as well, because, you know, this might be a new great hobby or habit for your dog to have um, for the rest of his life. OK, so Kongs, that's a chew toy we've all seen. Now, the thing with a Kong, everyone owns a Kong. Half of them are put in the cupboard, though. So only half of the people who actually own Kongs know actually how to use them or have found success because these things do not come with instructions. So I'm going to give you guys some instructions on how to use this Kong so it's your dog's best friend. Um, this right here, a bone, a nice little marrow bone. Um, this is actually belongs to a real animal at some point, and uh, now it belongs to my dog. So, <laughs> so these are great chew toys. Um, all right, so makes sense. Chew toys are these things. These are also called one player games, things that the dog can play with by themselves. Now, what I call two player games are as follows. Another, another word for two player games are interactive toys. Okay, so like this fetch stick, this is like a fake stick that we use. Uh, we can play tug of war with this stick. Um, we have a ball, which is great for fetching and chasing things. Uh, we also have a tug toy, right? We have this ball and we can tug on it and we can play tug of war with our dogs. Uh, and then we have plush toys, okay, plush toys. So there's, there, I want you guys to know how to separate these things. One of the big rules when we have uh, different types of toys is knowing how to use them. So when we're dealing with interactive toys, they're called interactive toys or two player games because the dog needs you in order to learn how to play with them properly. OK, some of the downside of leaving these toys out with your dog unattended, dogs will learn to tear these balls up, right? They break them apart. They eat the rubber. Um, sometimes the dog will pull the stuffing out of this toy um, or the squeakers out of this toy. right? And what happens is that's not what we want. We don't want dogs to learn to destroy or dissect uh, or ingest things because unfortunately, then we have to go buy a new freaking toy. It doesn't make any sense, right? Um, so we want to we want to really put our focus on hiding these toys early on 
um, and only bringing them out when we're actually going to play with them with these dogs. Now, uh, a lot of times people throw these out expecting the dog to already know how to play with them. But I'm going to show you just a couple things that could go wrong. Um, and I kind of alluded to it a little bit earlier, but check this out. It happens all the time. All right. Number one, we have a ball, right? So let's say I'm a puppy and I'm chilling and I see the ball and I start kicking it, right? I start kicking the ball around and I start playing. And man, this is like the cutest thing to see a dog be do all by himself. And the thing is, the dog will keep kicking it, keep chasing it, and the dog will put it in his mouth at some point, and the dog will drop it, it'll bounce, they'll still keep kicking it, and all this stuff happens. And this, all of this happens without us actually being involved with the dog. But the downside of it is as soon as we grab his ball and we throw it, and we ask him to bring it back, the dog goes, why the hell would I bring it back to you? That's stupid. That's not how I play the game. Right. And so what happens is by us not being involved with the ball, the dog doesn't know that they need you in order to play the game. So if you've ever had a dog who grabs the ball, puts it in his mouth, prances around with it and uh, never gives it to you, never walks to you because he's being possessive. This is usually how it happened when he was a puppy. Right. Um, if you have a dog who, you know, goes by the ball and then like kind of covers it like this and starts possessing it or grabs a toy and walks away with it and starts possessing it. This is because we leave these toys out with our dogs. Okay. These toys, we want to be able to teach them to fetch it, bring it back, fetch it, bring it back. Um, we're going to be doing another, we actually have, I already have a live stream that we talked about fetching. Um, I think it was live stream two um, from our Sunday classes. So, um, you guys want to go back into our library midway we start teaching fetch and exactly how to do it um so anyways balls don't leave them alone with your dog uh tug toys the best way for our dogs to not bring toys back or to teach them to let go is by leaving them so that they can possess them and chew on them not a good thing either and plush toys last but not least we see uh dogs will rip these things apart and anything with squeakers dogs are going to get a lot more motivated to rip those things apart dissect them, ingest those squeakers, and then guess what? You have to go buy another $20 plush toy. So it doesn't make sense. What we like to use plush toys for, um, we're gonna, when we go over our bite inhibition module, teaching our dogs not to bite us, plush toys become some of our best uh, toys, right, to, to teach that. So instead of biting my hand or teaching my dog to let go of my, I'm gonna teach my dog to let go of my hand and to take a tug toy or a plush toy and release the plush toy when I give them command to do so okay also one of the things with plush toys they resemble too much of things that we like they resemble our slippers they resemble hats beanies they resemble pillows they resemble things that unfortunately we can actually accidentally prime the dog to like destroying things just because they're similar to other things that we like okay so plush toys so these are interactive toys all of these and then these are our one player games one player game Two player games, one player game, two player games. All right. So keep that in mind. All right, guys. So let's talk about Kongs. People don't understand these things. So let's go over it. All right. Number one way we use a Kong. We've all seen these recipes online where you put peanut butter and you put chicken and you put treats and you put all this stuff in there. Um, the funny thing is that when the dogs are really, really young, sometimes just their simple kibble is all we really need, right? Um, the dogs don't have that sophisticated of a, of a palate. So just simply being able to give them food that they like um, is enough, right? And so we could just start with just basic kibble, okay? Now here's the here's kind of the, the science behind it. And um, here is why dog trainers recommend Kongs and bones over food bowls, okay? From the time that the, we started domesticating wolves, uh, wolves started getting domesticated very simply. Uh, we would be hunters and gatherers. We would hunt a buffalo, for example. That buffalo would, uh, we'd take all the meat off the buffalo. So then all that would be left would be the bones, the skin, uh, the cartilage, the marrow, some ligaments, all the stuff that we didn't want to eat, we would just throw away. 
okay? So what happens is uh, wolves would eventually find these carcasses on the outside of our camps, and they found out that this was a really cool food source. Like they didn't have to hunt. They could literally just go through our garbage and eat, you know, eat well, actually, right? So if we were thriving as the human, those wolves that were thriving as well. Um, so this ultimately was kind of dogs eating our garbage. And so dogs have kind of been going through the trash uh, for 33,000 years since we started domesticating them. So because dogs evolved with humans, dogs also evolved eating cartilage, bone, marrow, uh, and pretty much they were getting used to eating things that came out of bones right? Um, or there's a hollowed out vessel that had nutrients inside um, and uh, they that's how they got their nutrients. And so they evolved it this way, okay? And because 90% of the dog's day was trying to find something to eat, this was a huge motivator for them, okay? Dogs evolved this way, um, yeah, especially when we start, especially then, uh, they would focus so much more on eating than actually having to hunt, okay? So, this becomes a very primitive things for dogs to do. Now, when puppies are really, really small, using a bone sometimes can mess up their teeth. So if they chew on an actual hard bone, unfortunately, uh, they, you can chip their little baby needle teeth, the ones that hurt so bad when they try and bite you. So what we, they invented back in the 80s was the Kong, which in essence is a hollowed out, a hollowed out bone, right? But it's rubber and it has a higher volume inside of it that we can put stuff in. OK, um, it's also a funny shape, right? It kind of looks like a snowman or like the state puffed marshmallow. Um, and the purpose for that is so that it uh, it moves, uh, it moves in an odd way. OK, and so let's kind of look at this uh, phase one of teaching Kong training. What I'm going to do is I'm going to grab some kibble and I'm just going to put the dog straight kibble, dry kibble inside the Kong. It's that simple, guys. It's this freaking simple. Now, there's a couple uh, trains of thought in dog training where some trainers will actually just say, get rid of the bowl altogether. The bowl is kind of a wasted training opportunity. OK, uh, why is my dog falling in love with a piece of tin um, that when he just puts in his mouth and shakes around, it just annoys me? Why don't I teach my dog to to eat out of a vessel that he can, in essence, a food bowl that he can chew on? That's what this is. OK, um, but what this does is because it's harder for the dog to get the food. A, it slows down the dog's feeding. So we don't have to worry about things like bloat. We don't have to worry about the dog, um, you know, uh, scarfing down the food too fast and vomiting it later. Um, so we, we just controls and regulates feeding. But what it also does is it takes the dog back to a very primitive place. Uh, and puppies are pretty primitive. Um, takes them back to a primitive place where they actually have to scavenge for their food. And they have to work really hard to get this food out of it. All right. Um, this type of chew toy falls under a category of chew toys that's called a food game or a food puzzle. Um, just like any game, if the game, the game has to gradually get harder. So if the game is too hard up front, unfortunately, what happens is the kid doesn't want to play the game. So this is what we would consider to be level one. So let me show you what happens if I have a Kong on the floor and my dog comes and hits it. See how kibble just kind of falls out. If I hit it again, kibble falls out again. Hit it again, kibble falls out. So this is kind of like a slot machine, right? The more that the dog engages with the device, the more food that pops out of it, okay? Now, very quickly, your dog will learn if I just go like this and I just knock it over, all the kibble comes out and bada bing, bada boom, your dog just ate all the food and breakfast and dinner or lunch is done, okay? Uh, so this is what we call level one Kong training. Now, level one means it has to be easy. Every level one video game or level one course has to be easy. Why does it have to be easy? It has to be easy so that the learner wants to do level two, right? If it's too hard up front, the dog goes, F this. I don't want to do this anymore. This is dumb, right? So what we have to do is we have to make sure that it is easy enough for the dog to master and then motivate the dog to hit the next round. So what the next round of Kong training is, we get soggy kibble. So this is the dry kibble. This is the soggy kibble. Oops. It fell down. So we get soggy kibble, and that's what we add in there. So we just moisten that kibble, let it absorb all the water, as you can see, soggy. Um, and then after that, we go ahead and stuff that into the Kong. So if you guys remember what it looked like when the, when the dry kibble was in there, when we have soggy kibble, check it out. Hold on, let me move this. So now there's soggy kibble in there. 
And if I move it around, the kibble doesn't come out as quickly because there's a little bit more weight to it. You see it? So we want to really make sure that the dogs have soggy kibble in level two. Okay, now level three, uh, pretty much by the time you get ready for level three, uh, the dog's confidence with the Kong is going to be so high that uh, that you're able to go for the really fancy stuff. You're able to put the peanut butter in there. You're able to stuff the Kong all the way. You're able to put some fancy treats or maybe like some biscuits in there. Um, but a couple things I would recommend is like try not to buy things that are going to upset the dog's stomach. Right. A lot of times people will add so many, you know, concoctions to this that the dog ends up, you know, getting massive vomiting or diarrhea. And that's not a good that's not a good thing at all. Um, so it's not good for potty training and it's not good for meal regulation. So, sorry. Sorry, guys, if you're getting sick. All right. So make sense. So that's level one, level two, level three is really up to your creativity. Uh, go ahead and feed the dog that Kong in the, uh, with the, feed their meals with their Kongs. Um, and you're going to see that this kills a couple birds with the same stone. We're developing strong confidence, um, and a, a habit of the dog eating out of this Kong. You're going to see after about a week's time of Kong training, your dog's going to fall in love with this thing, start kicking it around. And he's going to can't wait, uh, for the food gods to, to grace his Kong one more time to put food in it. Um, a couple workarounds that I like, um, I will actually put, um, put multiple Kongs in rotation. So if I have a Kong, I will put kibble inside. I will, um, I will uh, put two or three probably Kongs in rotation. Uh, so I have like a breakfast, lunch, and dinner Kong. And when I'm done with one Kong, I remove it. As soon as the dog is done with the Kong during training, you're gonna remove it. You don't want it to just live there next to the dog so that the dog gets bored of it. You always want it to symbolize some type of excitement um, in, the dog's, in the dog's mind, all right? So go ahead and Kong train your dogs. Great, if you guys aren't gonna Kong train your dogs, um, they have other forms of stuffable food toys, but this is going to help a lot with chewing, teething. Um, for rescue dogs, it helps a lot with barking. Uh, it helps a lot with uh, unnecessary, dis unnecessary destruction. Uh, so any dogs over six months of age, Kongs can also benefit them as well. Dogs under six months of age, um, it's really appropriate and helpful for their teething and chewing stages. Okay, so Kong training. Any questions on Kong training before I move on, guys? I don't see any, so I am going to move forward. All right. So we still got these types of toys, dental chews. When do I know that my dog wants a dental chew? Um, anytime that you're, if you're holding your puppy and your dog just is going and frequently gnawing on your finger, what the dog is looking for, the dog is looking for pressure, right? And so dental chews like this provide that pressure that they can bite down. I don't know if you guys remember that itch in our gums when we were, when we were teething ourselves, uh, and we would just, our tongues would just keep playing with it over and over. I have braces, so I catch myself like all the time just pushing against my teeth because of the pressure just bothers me. Um, so dogs will do the exact same thing. Um, all right, perfect. Um, so the dental chews are going to be when you notice that your dog is just gnawing frequently. So instead of gnawing on your hands frequently, you just put the dog in their, in their penned off area and give them these things here. Okay. Um, another type of chew is this guy right here. This is another type of nylabone. Uh, see, I don't know. It's not. It's a It's a what is it? A benabone. Sorry, benabone. Um, it has a little bit of flavor to it. Different texture. Still shaped like a bone. Uh, dogs really like these knuckle parts on the bone for their teeth as well. All right. And then nub bones are there to stimulate the gums um, and scratch the gums and help move teeth around. So these, all of these types of chew toys are going to be really awesome. These things stay with your dog, including this. Um, and I just want to introduce one more chew toy that is one of my favorite toys. I'm not sponsored by this company, but I freaking love this company. Um, it's called the Busy Buddy brand. Okay. Busy Buddy is, this is a, a, a toy that my dog has already annihilated. If you can see, uh, this is called the Busy Buddy Jack toy. But if you guys want to look up Busy Buddy online, um, they do a great job of putting nylon bones, food toys, 
and dental chews all onto one bone, right? So if you see, you know, this is the nylon part, this is the dental part that helps massage the gums. And then also what goes on here, they have these rings of food that you could put on to the dogs. Um, they can put on here, like you just unscrews like so. All right, yeah, so this unscrews and we can actually put these meat discs uh, they're like treats. They're rawhide, they're bacon flavor, they're beef flavor, and you put them in between these layers, and then you just screw it all back together, and the dog has to work real hard to chew his way through this toy. Um, all of the puppies that I've ever exposed, this, I haven't met one puppy that didn't like this, right? And this is the Busy, Buzzy, the Busy Buddy Jack toy, uh, but they have a bunch of different dental toys. Uh, any dog under six months, uh, actually any dog under 10 months, this is a great toy for them. So go ahead and, and pick one of those up. Uh, Busy Buddy, if you're looking for sponsorships, you know, I'm looking for, I'll totally get sponsored by you. Um, all right, cool guys. Any questions so far about Chew Toys? We're gonna move on to a different module now. We only have about two hours here. Those of you guys who are sticking around with us, thank you so, so much for sticking around. Um, a couple things I wanna share with you guys real fast, uh, just to kind of take a break from all this lecture. Uh, let's see, where are we at? All right, any questions that you guys have, go ahead and email us at info at Canis Dog Training. If you guys aren't following us already, go ahead and follow us at Canis Behavior on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Um, and then, or check out our website, CanisDogTraining.com. Um, yeah, if you have any particular questions, again, this is more general knowledge for you guys to help give you guys a head start. This is not necessarily uh, uh, all complete, going to be in detail because every dog is slightly different. So feel free to email me there. I'll go ahead and put this up again at the end of the, of the live stream. Okay. So we got that. Also, I wanted you guys to know, um, I just started a podcast about two months ago. The podcast just got accepted by iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio. So now we're streaming live on all of these, on all of these platforms. It's called the Dog Trainers Podcast. Um, I will go ahead and put a link uh, at the end of this live stream uh, in the comment section of, uh, of this YouTube live stream so you guys can go and follow us. Yeah, if you guys want to know, pretty much the whole idea of the Dog Trainers podcast uh, is me and one of my friends who's also a dog trainer uh, and all of our dog trainer friends. We're all coming in on a podcast so that way we can uh, educate people on dog stuff. Right. Uh, so, so a lot of times people don't necessarily understand what it's like to be a dog trainer. They don't understand the issues that we have to deal with uh, in regards to helping dogs behavior. And one thing I've loved in this journey, every dog trainer that I've met um, loves dogs, right? They love them, love them, love them. And I think one of the big reasons why there's so much argument between, um, you know, method and ideas and philosophies is because we're so protective over animals. Right. And so we really uh, we created this dog trainers podcast so we could have a conversation with other dog trainers in L.A., uh, other experts in their field, people who've been doing it 10, 12, 15 years. Um, so that way we can all learn from each other. Um, it's called the Dog Trainers Podcast. Again, you can find it on Google, iHeartRadio and iTunes. All right. Um, cool. So let's go ahead and move on to our next one. Now, this is probably going to be a common issue for a lot of people. Um, just chime in real quick. If you guys are listening, just send like a yes or something. Are you guys dealing with confinement issues, like working with the crate, working with the puppy pen? Does your dog whine, bark, all that stuff uh, a lot, you know, when you try and leave them alone? Does your dog have issues with this? Any comments on that? Man, I really wish I could see everyone's face, right? You know, most likely if you have a puppy, this is a big issue that you're dealing with. So the next module we're going to talk about, we're going to be talking about uh, what I call den training. Okay. Uh, yeah, your foster. Yep, exactly. So uh, we're going to talk about den training. So den training, whether you have a puppy, whether you have a foster dog, a rescue dog, it doesn't matter. Um, there's a couple things I want us to keep in mind. Okay. Um, dens in the wild right have a have a couple uses for dogs or not dogs for animals dens are usually clean 
right? So they're usually very, very sanitary. A lot of times people think that like a bear's den would be covered in feces and be dirty. But if you actually walked into a bear's den, um, you know, I watched so much National Geographic as a kid. Um, so that makes me an expert. <laughs> but uh, it's clean. A wolf's den is clean. A coyote's den is clean. Um, and, and mother wolves, bears, mothers of these species, they make, a, they make it a point to make sure that these dogs' dens are extremely clean, okay? Um, and this is what helps us in potty training. So those of you guys who are not implementing any type of den training, crate training, um, confinement training in regards to your potty training, you're going to see a huge game changer once we can get these dogs used to being away from us or separated from us. Okay. Uh, the way that the denning instinct works from the time that dogs are really, really small, um, a mother tries really hard to make sure the puppies stay clean and the den stays clean. So it kind of leads to some kind of gross behaviors where the mother will eat the animal's feces uh, so that they don't have to live in it, that they'll constantly lick them and make sure that they don't have urine on them. Um, and you'll see that, that this, clean, this cleaning process happens a lot with very, very small puppies. You see it with uh, mother dogs who just had a litter of puppies. They're constantly cleaning them and keeping the den clean. Um, so, you, so you'll see this. What happens is... The do every animal has a natural desire uh, and aversion to their own feces. So we don't like poops and pees, right? We, we hate it. Um, and so what we want to do is we want to tap into this instinct when potty training. Um, and we also want to tap into this instinct when, in essence, housebreaking our dogs. A lot of times people think housebreaking means just potty training. Housebreaking actually means how to teach an animal to live inside of a house, right? So we have to work on those things. All right. Um, so den training. Number one thing. Um, do you have a den and what is your den? So commonly a den can be a crate, just like the one you see over there, that crate right there. It could be a puppy pen, just like the one you see over there, that golden gate. Um, see, my puppy whines and barks when we leave him alone. Of course he does. We're going to go over that, Bo. A lot of puppies are going to be doing that. Um, all right. Um, so if you have a den, great. You already started on the right track. Now, how do we get dogs to go into these things? Um, there's this there's this idea of gradual, right, that happens. Now, it, this one, I'm going to say with young puppies who don't know anything, we can actually be a little bit more uh, proactive with it. For some dogs who may, you know, may come from a rescue or may have had a bad past or may have been caged or had a bad experience with crates, um, this is where it kind of varies, right? So if we have a rescue dog, who hates the crate like i've met dogs who you put them in the crate uh 30 seconds later they've ripped the bars open that's how much they hate the crate right i've met dogs who um you know if, if they are escape artists they've i've met, i've trained a dog that jumped out of the second story window twice to go find their owner because they had that bad of separation anxiety okay so i just want to kind of prime you guys in understanding how important uh, den training is uh, because it teaches our dogs confidence. It teaches them independence. Uh, we all know this in theory, and I'm going to get into the meat of it all, how we actually get our dogs to do it. Uh, but those of you guys who are on the fence of wondering, like, oh, I don't really like crates, or I don't really like puppy pens, or, you know, I don't really like to, I, I totally get where you're coming from because you don't like to see your dog sad, right? So our goal is how do we get to teach, how do we teach our dogs to like the separation? Okay, so I always use this room analogy. OK, and this room analogy is going to help us understand all the things that we need to do inside the dog's den. When we were kids, uh, our bedrooms uh, sometimes were our sanctuary, right? Um, our bedrooms are where we slept at night. So we learned to relax in there. Our bedrooms are where we sometimes went to go do our homework, right? Because it was quiet in there. Our bedroom is also where we had our toys and we would play with our friends in there. Uh, we would just we might play video games in there. It really depends how you grew up, right? Um, our bedroom would also be where we wanted to go if we wanted to be left alone, right? Especially when we're teenagers, we're like, leave me alone, mom, go to my room. And then we go to our room, we slam the door, and then we don't talk to our parents forever because we're doing our own thing, all right? So all of these things that I just described are very normal and positive associations with our bedroom, right? The only time that we hated being in our bedroom was when we were told to go there against our will. Right. So if we got in trouble or if we mouthed off to our parents and they were like, go to your room, you'd be like, oh, I hate you guys. Boom. We go to our room and we were so pissed that we had to go to our room. 
okay? I just named four positive reasons to go to your room. The only time that we hate going to our room is when we were forced there against our will. So what our goal is in DEN training is to teach these other four things, eating, playing, being left alone, and sleeping, right? These four things, if we can teach these things in the dog's den regularly throughout the day, your dog has four out of five reasons to love his den, okay? Now we're gonna teach you guys what to do when the dog is actually barking or whining, but I wanna make sure that you guys are being consistent with these four. So number one, make sure your dog eats in his room, okay? So you literally grab the food bowl or the Kong filled with food and you put it in the dog's crate or puppy pen and that's where the dog eats and you leave him in there until he is done with his food, all right? Sometimes dogs may not eat initially because they're so busy trying to get out of the crate if you haven't put him in there before, um, but that's what we're gonna do, okay? A lot of times people will say, oh, my dog eats in the crate all the time, and I go, great. And then I say, so how long does he stay in there? And they go, well, well the, the door's open. And I go, oh, okay. So they're like, we're supposed to close the door? And I go, yes, of course. It came with a door so that you could close the door, right? And so part of what we want to do is we want to start kind of taking that quantum leap forward where we put the dog in, we close the door, and we just sometimes see what happens, okay? Uh, let me go ahead and grab the crate real quick that I have set up over there. And we're going to do a demo demonstration. All right. Okay, so we got this little crate. And inside this crate, we can have a food bowl or a Kong. What I like to do is I'll just grab the food bowl, I'll throw it to the back, the dog will go and receive his food, and we'll go ahead and close the door just like this, right? Sounds pretty simple so far. Two things that might go wrong. The dog might eat his food, turn around and go, why the hell am I in here? Or the dog will notice that you close the door and go, what the F? What, who said that you could, who said you could lock me in, right? The key is, is, if this is the case, then this means that the dog doesn't have enough experience eating in his crate. So sometimes what we have to do is we have to take a little step back with training. We have to make the crate a fun place for the dog to go. So stage number one, and this is not necessarily, uh, this is a game, a side, a, side, uh, a side exercise that you do. You can grab some treats, you throw it in the crate, you know, you throw it in the crate, you let the dog go in the crate, eat the, eat the food, have them come right back out. We can close the door, walk to the crate, open the door, throw some treats in, let the dog come out, and then close the door. And we just repeat this pattern 10, 15 times a day. We just make it a, like a side project for the dog. Little by little, when we keep that door open, the dog's going to pop right in on his own. And accepting food is already primed in his brain. So if we just you know, walked over to the door, threw some food in, let the dog go ahead and get it, and then he came back out, we closed the door, and we just did that, let's say, 10 times in one hour. And we just did that every three hours. We did it 10 times in one hour, right? The dog will learn anytime that that door opens, he has to pop into that crate, okay? Once he's popped into that crate and I offer him food, now his brain is already primed to eat his breakfast and his dinner. So just a cool little trick for you guys. It works all the time. Go ahead and try that if your dog hates being in the crate or it won't eat in the crate. OK, so that's eating in the crate. That's something we want to make sure that he does. The, the third thing we want to do, we want to talk about resting in the crate or in the puppy pen. So resting anytime that you've played with your dog or you see that your dog is tired or if you just see that your dog is, you know, heavy eyed and just kind of falling asleep. If your dog falls asleep at your feet or falls asleep on the couch or falls asleep, you know, off in the corner. That is a perfect opportunity for you to guide your dog into their crate. Make sure the crate is comfortable, guide them in there, and let them know, go to your room if you want to sleep. Okay? The same way when I used to fall asleep on the couch, my dad would be like, get up. We're watching TV. Go to your room. <laughs> and I would have to get up all groggy, go to my room, and I would be able to pass out there. Okay? Um, so we want to kind of guide our dogs. Anytime that we notice they're naturally getting tired, we guide them to rest in their crates. Um, and this is both during the daytime for naps, and this is also during nighttime for sleeping, right? Here's one of the catch, you know, the catch 22s. A lot of people don't put their dogs in the crate because the dog is barking their head off. Well, the reason the dog is barking their head off at nighttime is because you don't put them in the crate during the day and practice. Okay. Now there is going to be a super pivotal step. I teach all of you guys who are watching this. 
The pivotal step is how, what do I do when my dog is barking his head off? I'm going to go over that at the very, very end, because if I teach it to people first, people tend to not pay attention to all the other stuff I'm trying to teach them. <laughs> so they just want to do that last part. Um, so the dog needs to eat in the den. The dog needs to rest in the den. The dog needs to chew in the den. Okay, so chewing would be like this toy, right? You put the meat stuff on it, you get the bone, you stuff a hot dog or some food in there, you grab the Kong, you put some food in there. And what we can do is we can actually break up the dog's meal multiple times a day, just shove it inside of a Kong and just throw it in there for him, close the door and let him just hang out in there until he's done. Okay, until he's done. All right. Um, the key here is we want to let the dog know it's incremental, right? So we can do like until you're done eating, until you're done napping, until you're done chewing, right? We kind of teach the dog, you go in there. This is your learning chamber, if you will. This is your bedroom. When you're done with your tasks, you get them right back out. Okay. The cool thing though is because the dog is in the crate, the likelihood of him falling asleep is very, very high. OK, um, now this is not to say without a tantrum or anything like that, um, but this is something we're going to go over now. OK, so any questions about the other areas that we talked about, the eating, the sleeping, the chewing, anything like that, guys, the tr the training in the, in the beginning. Right. We want to just teach that first. OK, um, hmm. let me see something. wonder if I have. I bring my little girl back, little Maya. She's actually really good in her crate, so it's not really a fair, uh, a fair example. All right, let's try this. This is a huge game changer for a lot of people who, who I work with, right? I have people that they go, you know, I've, I've tried this method in the crate. I've tried for 10 minutes first. I've, I've rewarded the dog after 30 seconds. Um, the, the issue is this. Dogs, puppies, in essence, are infants, right? Eight weeks to four months, they're infants. The problem is they're infants that can physically do a lot of stuff, right? So they are babies up here, but they physically can punch and chew and rip things apart and run and chase and do all this cool, crazy stuff. So in our minds, when they are inside of their crate and they're chewing on it or throwing a tantrum, you know, we, we hear words in our head. We go, this is fucked up. Let me out of here. This is bullshit. Like this is what we play in our head as the conversation that they're having with us. Um, and in actuality, the dog is just having, um, you know, just the uh, being alone anxiety. Or it's not even separation anxiety. It's the fact the dog doesn't like the fact that we put them in there against their will. Right. If the dog walked in there on their own and we see a lot of this with rescue dogs, some dogs, some rescue dogs will go into their crate on their own. But boy, if you close that door without their permission, they're going to throw a fit. Right. So the, the idea is that the, nothing is necessarily wrong with the crate is the fact that the dog gets anxious based on he doesn't have the choice to get out if he wanted to. Right. In essence, the kid isn't getting what he wants. So therefore, he throws a tantrum. Right. And a lot of times if we don't look at it this way, obviously our hearts melt. We freak out. We want to let the dog come out. And obviously we don't want to see our dogs under stress. But this is something I want to tell you guys. When the dog is in their crate, the tantrum will subside. Right. At some point, sometimes the tantrum needs to subside with our intervention, though. OK, there are some you know trains of thought that just say, let the dog freak out and get tired and fall asleep. This does work sometimes if the nature of your dog's whining and barking is that they're tired, right? So sometimes, um, you know, if you're playing with a dog and you see that they're kind of acting kind of savagely and ferociously and they're grabbing you and they, they, they kind of looks like they're drunk and that they're losing, losing coordination, I guarantee if you grab that dog, put him in the crate, he'll probably bark for two, three minutes and then pass out, right? So in that scenario, yes, let the dog go in there, ignore him, leave him alone. OK, but if you guys have tried to have your dog in there for five minutes, 10 minutes, and you've seen that your dog gradually escalates in a tantrum, tantrum one, tantrum two, tantrum level five, till eventually they get to this point where they're just like, fuck this, this is bullshit. And we just can't bear it because either we live in an apartment or our neighbors can hear it or we just don't want to see our dogs freak out. And we let the dog out. We messed up. That was the wrong feedback that we should have done with our dogs. So I want to guide you guys through a process. 
Okay. I learned this a long time ago. The way that you can control mental states and emotion is by controlling your physicality. This is something that we believe in in dog training all the time. How do we get dogs to calm down mentally? We get them to stop acting physically aggressive, right? So let's go ahead and, and try this out. If I have a dog inside my crate and my dog is whining, so we have to be able to see, is my dog sitting there whining? Mm, 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 mm. Or is my dog actively moving around? Is he pacing? Is he like pawing at the crate? Is he like actively trying to escape, right? If my dog is just whining, mm, 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 then we can ignore it, all right? So we'll call that like on a scale of one to 10, one being quiet and 10 being trying to break out of the crate, we'll call whining level four, level five, okay? But after level five, right here in the middle, we start seeing that the dog might physically be doing something. So we might see that the dog might be you know, pacing around, might be freaking out, the dog might be uh, trying to gnaw at the crate, the dog might be punching at the side of the crate, or the dog might be lifting himself and like trying to pry the bars open, okay? It's in those moments of panic that usually break our hearts. Okay, so in those moments, what we actually want to do is we actually want to distract the dog with something else. We want to break and interrupt that tantrum. Okay, now this is changes from dogs to dogs, but usually how we break a tantrum is we have to find something that surprises the dog. Okay, so what I like to do is I like to have a point that uh, we put a cap on, like a behavior that we put a cap on. So if the dog is just whining, not worried about it. If that whining escalates to trying to escape or physically push against the crate or freaking out in that fashion, this is where we're going to address the behavior with a surprise. Okay. Now the surprise changes from dog to dog. Okay. There are some dogs that if I just go hey and clap my hands, the dog goes, huh? 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 What happened? What happened? Where am I? Right? We've all seen kind of like that old Hollywood movie where the person's acting hysterical and they go, get a hold of yourself, man. And then they slap him across the face and that person goes, oh, what happened? Okay, I'm good. I'm good. Right? We're not saying hit your dog across the face. But what we're saying is surprise your dog, redirect his mental energy onto something else. Now, we're not necessarily saying redirect his mental energy to a bone because when your dog is stressed, your dog may not be hungry. The last thing on your dog's mind is to actually eat something. But what we can do is we can clap our hands. We can say, hey, we can, you know, the old school method was grab like a can with some pennies. And anytime the dog started a tantrum, the dog would freak out and go, sorry. Okay. What we're trying to do is we're trying to let the dog feel anytime he goes past a certain point of a tantrum that something that he's in control of will happen. Right. So like imagine if every time I cried, um, a zombie came out and was like, blah, 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 right. In those moments, I would refrain from crying. Right. Um, and so what we're trying to do is we're, this is all a psychological thing. And, and please, guys, your dog will not need therapy after doing this so many times, I guarantee it. Um, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to break and interrupt the tantrum. Right. Just like in those old movies. So another thing that we could do is we could actually tap the side of the crate and go, nope tap the side of the crate. Um, we can grab um, like a book and we can slam it against the coffee table. Um, we can, you know, there's a, there's a couple different things. It needs to just be a sharp, loud noise that abruptly stops the dog from the tantrum. Now, I want to be very, very clear with this method, guys, because this is where people are going to go, well, isn't that abusive? Isn't that mean? Isn't that this? Isn't that that? Um, we're not, we don't want you to physically touch or hurt your dog. So I want you guys to really work on figuring out what non-physical way can I snap the dog out of it, okay? And I want you guys to very be very crystal clear with the point in which you teach that dog uh, that this reaction is going to happen, right? So I always do if the dog starts physically trying to escape, if the dog is inside the crate and starts pushing against the door, starts biting the wires, that's when I'm going to interrupt them, okay? This is a huge game changer, guys. It's really easy. A lot of people are scared to do it, 
All right, a lot of people are worried that it's it's not positive or that it's that it's gonna mess the dog up. Guys, what really messes the dog up is the dog not being able to be left alone. That's what really messes the dog up. The fact that the dog can't be away from you. So when we use den training and confinement training, we're hitting a bunch of birds with the same stone. We are helping our potty training. We're teaching our dogs independence. We're giving our dogs a space where they can learn how to chew on the right things. And we're keeping our dogs from being out in the environment so long that they chew on the wrong things, right? Where they actually end up, you know, chewing on our shoes or couch, all those things. So when we can teach our dogs to be confined and love and like their room, then it's a huge game changer altogether. Now, anyone who's watching who goes, well, maybe I've tried it or I haven't tried it, I'm happy to give you guys a free session on this um, via, via Skype or online or Google, whatever, um, to coach you through it. Because there are some dogs out there who they're just so determined it may not work. There's other tricks and methods to it. But generally speaking, I would say 90% of the time, being able to interrupt our dog's tantrum creates great results. Okay, and, it, and if you guys try it and it's not working, again, email me. Where is it? Where is it? Here you go. Email me or DM me here, and I'm happy to give you guys a free session just on that um, because it is so easy. It's ridiculous that a lot of people aren't teaching it. Okay. Um, does anyone have any questions on the confinement stuff? Hold on, I see. Do we do this with Foster, even though my dog eats outside of crate, or do I need to put up den crate for my dog too? Um, good question, um, Brittany. Uh, so her question is: Do we need this? Uh, do we do this with the Foster, even though my dog eats outside of the crate, um, or do I need to put up a den slash crate for my dog as well during meal times? Uh, so the answer I would say is like yes. If you guys have multiple dogs. Um, the better the structure, if the structure is the same across the board, just the easier it is for the dogs to understand what, what they're doing, right? Um, sometimes, you know, if another dog goes over to the other dog's bowl and starts looking at them through the crate and starts challenging them, we can just simply avoid that by either putting the food on the other in a different room um, or inside of a crate next to each other so that they can figure that out. All right. Does anyone have any questions about the den training, the confinement, or most importantly, the interrupting of the tantrum? Anybody? Mm -hmm. There we go. That's a question. Good question. When is it okay to give more space in the crate? Um, when your dog isn't having accidents in there, that's a number one, right? Um, if you can, if you know that your dog regularly is holding it and keeping his and holding his bladder and holding his feces while he's in the crate, then, you know, I would say every two weeks, every two to three weeks, we can start extending that divider in the crate just a little bit. If you, if that's what we're talking about, a divider inside the crate. Um, so yeah. So when is it okay to give space when your dog is showing you that they can hold it? Um, I honestly wouldn't give a dog too much more space. Uh, so like a lot of times people will buy a crate, um, and then they will, um, They'll, they'll just give the dog the whole thing. And then unfortunately what happens is the dog learns to live on this side of the crate and they learn to poop and pee on this side of the crate. So uh, pretty much we, we give the dog space when we know consistently we can predict their bowel movements. We know that they're consciously holding it inside of their den area. Um, and then we go ahead and, and can offer them more space. Sometimes we're just experimenting. Right. We give the dog more space to see how they handle it. We might find a surprise like, oh, you know, he's pooping and peeing again. So we just completely close it down again. That's our telltale sign. The dog's not ready. Uh, but I would say definitely, definitely keep the dog at the same size crate for at least three weeks before you start giving him more and more. And we want to see that the dog is getting better and better at holding it and hitting their marks in the potty areas that we want them to go. That's a good question, Ken. Thanks. Any other questions on den training, confinement training? Uh, before we move on. Okay, quick little recap on this, a little checklist and den training. A, do you have a den? If not, get one. 
Number two, do does your dog eat in the den? Does your dog rest in the den? Does your dog chew in the den? And does your dog hold it in the den? These are all questions that you guys really need to answer. All right. If you guys have are answering no to all of the or to some of these or one of these and you guys want workarounds or troubleshooting again reach out to me on my social media email me info at canisdogtraining.com or dm me at, at canis behavior um, and i'm happy to answer those questions in person and in real time for free guys all right ken one more question when can they sleep outside of their crate and on a bed um the biggest mistake people make in crate training is just because the dog can hold it, they tend to give them a lot of freedom. Um, I honestly wouldn't for many reasons, and I'll, I'll explain my story with, with my dog um, and many other situations and case studies with, with my clients' dogs. Um, I would keep my dog in a crate in different intervals for the first year of their life. Okay, and the reason I would say this is because in one year, your dog's going to go through about four developmental stages, right? They go through toddler stage, child stage, preteen, and then straight up teenager, okay? Uh, the age groups for this, toddler stage is before four months. Before four and six months is going to be their childhood stage, right? Uh, their preteen stage is going to be seven months to about nine months. And pure adolescence, like straight up teenager, is going to be from about 10 months to about a year, okay? And each of these stages of development bring their own behaviors uh, that are thwarted by a good creating schedule, okay? Um, the first two, one of the big things that confinement is going to help you with is um, potty training and chew training, making sure that your dog does not have so much freedom that he's biting this, chewing that, destroying this, destroying that. And then the, when the dog's older, the preteen and the actual teenager, what this does is this teaches our dogs the value of patience because we're continue to confine them. It also teaches them, um, it also teaches them, uh, the dogs are going to go through harder chewing stages around six months. So around six months, our dogs are going to have most of their adult teeth fully grown in. And if you guys have ever seen Marley and me, the scene where Marley rips up the couch, he was around six months, right? So as soon as the dog's teeth are fully grown in around six months, six and a half months, uh, that's when dog's mouths want to chew on stuff. They want to strengthen their jaw. That's where they chew on, on harder things, metal hardwoods, hard plastics. That's usually when your patio furniture gets destroyed if the dog's an outside dog. So I would keep the dog in the crate. My recommendation is the first year of the dog's life, the crate is the dog. The, the dog has the crate as his room. Um, this doesn't mean if like, you know, if you want to create a, a rule, like on the weekends, the dog can sleep in bed with you or can sleep in your room with you. Just make sure you pick up all your slippers, your sandals, because I started this. I tried it a little bit with my personal dog, um, actually after he was a year old. And what was so funny was my dog would grab his bone or his busy buddy and I would be trying to sleep. He'd go grab his toy in the other room and jump onto my bed and start chewing. The funny thing with teenagers, just like human teenagers, they don't sleep in the middle of the night. They stay up till like one, two in the morning. So if I'm trying to sleep at like 10, teenage dogs are kind of the same. If given freedom and opportunity, they will stay up late just like a normal teenager, right? So what would happen is my dog would bring the toy up, he'd chew, 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 and get close to the edge of the bed, and then it'd fall off the edge of the bed, and then it would wake my ass up. And I'd be like, what the F? Why is this happening? <laughs> and he'd do that once, twice, three times. I probably did that for about a week, hoping it would get better. Then I would just guide him back to his crate. <laughs> now he's finally, you know, two, almost two years old. He doesn't do that anymore. He goes to bed. You know, if I let him sleep on my bed, he'll fall asleep right away. If I tell him to go to his bed, he'll go to his bed right away and sleep. Um, but yeah, it's the first year is the answer. All right. Sorry to elaborate so much. Um, any other questions before we move on from den training and crate training? Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. So make sure we develop those positives, guys. That's where the dog eats in the crate. The dog naps in the crate. The dog chews in the crate. Um, and the dog's I said sleep already and the dog can hold it in the crate. Those are the main areas. All right. So one of the very last uh, couple modules that we want to go over, we want to go over bite inhibition and puppy biting. Um, uh, it's, they're kind of the same thing. 
I want to paint a picture for you guys. Dogs who are mouthing, biting, and chewing all over you. If we follow all these other steps, chewing, uh, you know, scheduled chewing, we put the dog in the crate to chew on bones regularly. Uh, we have to start creating a, a bit of a schedule. Now, if we kind of go back to that potty training uh, diagram that we were doing, anytime the dog poops and pees in the right spot, now we can give the dog extended amounts of freedom. So an hour, two hours, it's up to the age of your dog. But in those areas where the dog is free, we have a couple things that we can teach the dog. We can play games with them. We can teach them obedience, or we can work on bite inhibition. Now, every dog that is under four months uh, definitely work on bite inhibition because the window for bite inhibition work closes around 18 months of age, right? So if your dog is 18 months, over 18 months, and is still biting, um, a lot of these techniques won't work for you guys. But if you guys have dogs that are younger than 18 months, um, then it, it, there's still hope and we can work on these things, okay? Um, so let's go over bite inhibition. Bite inhibition uh, has two stages. We're teaching the dog how hard they can use their mouth. In essence, we're teaching how strong the dog's mouth is to the dog. And then the second one, we're teaching the dog what's appropriate to bite on and what's not appropriate to bite on, right? Two stages. Um, a lot of the mistakes that people make is they want to eliminate dog biting altogether, right? So um, they kind of create this combativeness where the dog mouths them and they go, ow, stop, no bite, cut it out, no. And the dog comes right back at them again, right? Um, and so what happens is if all we're focusing on is no bite, no bite, no bite, Unfortunately, what happens is, A, the dog doesn't understand because the dog's trying to play with you and fuck with you a little bit. Um, and B, if we try and eliminate the dog's biting first, then what happens is the dog never gets any feedback of what is the appropriate way to use his mouth, right? So um, two basic rules for biting. Now, some of you guys may have gone on YouTube and, and checked some of these things out. I'm going to give you my version of this. Um, and, you know, not to float my own boat, I think it's really effective, okay? Um, when I have a really, really small puppy and I'm holding them, I'm purposely going to look for moments to get my dog to bite me. This is on purpose. The, the lot of, a lot of the time, and this is the key to training, is we create the problem on purpose so that we can teach what we want in that context. Does that make sense? So a lot of times if people are cooking – or reading a book or working on a computer and the dog just comes and goes bam tags them automatically our response is going to be defensive or we go what the f don't do that right but if we purposely grab our puppies put them on the couch pet them touch their faces a little bit scratch behind their ear now we can start triggering some of this some of this mouthy behavior Okay. And I want you guys to be ready because we actually, in this section, we actually want our dogs to mouth and bite us on purpose. Okay. The very, very first stage, we are going to teach our dogs what hard bites feel like. Okay. Now, again, this works mostly for dogs under the age of four months. If your dog is older than four months, we have to do a slightly different tactic that we can't do uh, right now in this live stream. Okay. Um, the very first thing is we got to give the dog feedback of what too hard is. So what this looks like, if the dog is biting and is biting down, biting, 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 and then you feel that crunch, usually the dog will put your hand or the fingers all the way to the back of his uh, molars and chomp down real hard. In those scenarios, we have to startle the dog. We have to call him out pretty much that that freaking hurt, right? Now online, people will say, say the word ouch. Ouch, right? I don't like the word ouch, and it's going to seem like I'm splitting hairs here, because of the way that people react to it emotionally, right? So, so many times I will see my clients say the word ouch, and they'll go, ouch, ow, ow. And what happens, it automatically puts us in a little bit of a defensive state because the word ouch usually means pain. Um, and very rarely does someone go, ouch, cut it out, right? So that's more of an offense versus a defense, right? And so a lot of times, if the dog is truly hurting us or biting us, sometimes we can't control this immediate reflex to remove our hands. So the dog is chewing, he crunches down, and we go, ouch, right? The problem is, and we're gonna do this in slow motion, if my hand goes backwards, and my dog is gonna then come after my hand as it's going backwards. So that's number one. We can't remove our hands really quickly when our dogs bite us. But this is the difference. We're actually ready for the bite. 
So we're going to purposely grab our dogs, put them on our lap, put them on the couch, pet them, get on the floor with them, pet them. And we're waiting for that moment that they go crunch really, really hard. Okay. The key is, is you're creating the moment. The dog isn't making it up as they go. You're literally waiting for him to bite you in those moments. So what I like to say, instead of the word, ouch, I like to say the word out. I know it's splitting hairs, not that big of a deal, but the word out comes from a lot of the German sports. Uh, in German sport, they say, "Aus," like out, like get out. Uh, so what I like to do is I like to tell people, say out the way you would, like telling your brother, get out of my room, out, get out, right? And naturally what it does, is it primes us verbally to say it with a little bit more intensity, out versus ouch, right? So try it out. It might work for you. If not, say ouch. I don't care. But the idea is sometimes the words we use provoke a certain emotion, right? So I say the word out. Now, out will also later come back when we start teaching like tug of war and stuff like that, which we're going to go over on Friday, uh, which is our, our Facebook Live. So those of you guys who want to see the extension of these things, go ahead and check us out on Facebook Live as well. OK, um, so we're going to say the word out. Right. So the dog is chewing, 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 crunch. We're going to go out. OK, now the thing is, we're not going to remove our hands. Remember, that's number one. And number two, is we have to startle the dog. The key is not to go, ow, ooh, no, stop, uh, right? We don't want to be meek in, in our responses. We want to be reactive in the response, okay? In the same way that this works, when we go, hey, cut it out, or tapping the side of the crate, the key is the dog is in this obsessive state of mind, almost a meditative state of mind, and what we're trying to do is snap them out of it, okay? And we're trying to bring attention and mark that moment that the dog did something that hurt you. All right. Now, what you're going to see is if you keep your hand there and you go, ouch, the dog's going to remove his mouth from you and he might go back, but he's definitely going to go back softer. OK, if he goes back softer, good boy, good boy, good boy. He might do it five seconds later, bite down hard. Ouch or out. And good boy, good boy. If he backs his mouth off, we're getting the result that we want. Now, there is a circumstance where the dog, if we say out or ouch, the dog's going to actually stimulate him. And he's going to go, oh, I like that. I got a rise out of him. And in those moments, this is where we have to deal with stuff a little bit different. Okay. If the dog goes out or we go ouch and the dog comes back again, we're going to try only one more time. Only one more time where we're going to go, ouch, I said that hurt. Okay. And I like saying, ouch, I said that hurt because it forces me to continue to tell the dog something. So I want you guys to make sure when you say, ouch, you're looking at your dog right in the eye and you're going, ouch, that hurt. And you're actually looking the dog in the eye. What we're doing is we're taking a little bit of body language from animals and we're using the eye contact to get inside the dog's head to intimidate him just a little bit because we're bigger than him. Right. So we want him to know, ouch, that freaking hurt. So you got to do your little Clint Eastwood, like make my day punk. Right. So we're trying to do that. We're using our eye contact to magnify um, our displeasure with that. So ouch, it's like a bark. Right. The eye contact and the stare is letting the dog know you, you're the one that did that. Don't do it again. Right. If the dog comes back for a second round or a third round, this is now where we're going to go. I've had enough. We're going to go, ouch. We're going to push the dog away from us, right? Don't hit the dog, push him away from you. And you're going to leave the room. You're going to walk out of the room. Okay. Whatever out of the room is. Okay. Um, it could just be, you know, to the kitchen. It could just be to the, um, you know, to your bedroom, to the bathroom, whatever it is. You're going to say out and you're going to push him away and walk away. Okay. Because what's happening is you're letting the dog know, I freaking warned you once. I freaking warned you twice. I don't want to play anymore. And by us telling the dog, I don't want to play anymore and leaving the room. Now he just lost his play session. Right now we're going to do this for about a minute, two minutes, and then we're going to come back to our dog and we're going to see if our dog simmered down and calmed down. If the dog looks apologetic and goes, I'm so sorry. Didn't mean to do that, which sometimes they might really sensitive puppies act that way. Or sometimes let's say the dog just looks a little calmer and he's wagging his tail more appease, appeasing. Um, then what we're going to do, we're going to ask the dog to come, ask the dog to sit if he knows, bring the dog to you and just let him know, hey, no hard feelings. Just don't freaking bite me like that. Okay. We're just going to create this 
this loop where if I say, ouch, I'm telling the dog it hurt. If the dog stops biting down hard, I'm going to, I'm going to continue to allow him to engage with me. If the dog wants to challenge me and make a game out of it, I'm going to physically push him away and end the play session, right? Give the dog two to three minutes to cool down, then come back and interact with your dog. Okay. This is the, a sl the slowest version, but it's the healthiest version of teaching our dogs how to interact with us guys. A lot of people want to get rid of the act of biting first. And what happens, the dogs never teach what the proper way to use their mouth is. So unfortunately when they're adults, they end up accidentally biting too hard. They end up nipping and making a dog bleed accidentally at the dog park. And so this is why this is super duper important. Okay. So this is all phase one we talked about. It's pretty hefty, like in length, because it's super important to do it right. So little recap, purposely grab your dog, create an event where you can sit on the couch, sit on the floor and pet your dog, stroke their face, grab their back of their ear, under their chin and get that dog to mouth you on purpose. If the dog is mouthing you normally, you're fine. If the dog bites down hard and crunches, you're gonna say ouch or out, something guttural that sounds like a bark. Right. That's why these words are used. OK. Um, and instead of pulling your hand away, you're going to keep the hand there. And instead of just saying, ouch, ouch, it's ouch. Look the dog in the eye and say, that freaking hurt. <laughs> you say, ouch, that freaking hurt. Stop. OK. And what happens is that confrontation. Don't forget that little confrontation with your eyes. You're literally trying to let the dog know, don't do that again. That really hurt. Okay. In the event your dog comes back for a second round, one more, one more chance. That third time, push the dog away, leave the room. Come back two minutes later and repeat. Okay. So this is stage one. A week later, what we're going to do is the exact same thing. The only difference is, is we're now going to do it not for hard bites. We're going to do it for, um, for any time the dog puts downward pressure on our hands. Okay, so anytime the dog puts downward pressure on your hands, you're going to treat it the same way. Uh, in essence, we're just going to tell the dog now we're more sensitive than we were last week. So before the dog was biting down really hard, causing pain. Now the dog is just putting pressure and we're going to go, ouch, that hurt. And we're going to treat it the exact same way. And we want the dog to either lick you in this stage or we want the dog to graze you lightly with his teeth, but not put downward pressure. OK, if we're able to do these first two things, this only takes two weeks, guys. If you do it consistently, it only takes two weeks and it's a huge game changer for everything, for everything. OK, so this is stage one. This is teaching the dog the strength of their bite. OK, phase two, then we start eliminating bites altogether. So let me just recap real fast. One second. All right. Here we go. This is the checklist. So bite strength checklist. Call out all hard bites. That's number one. Then one week later, we're going to call out all bites with pressure. Okay. A little couple tips for you guys. Make sure you guys are being sharp with the ouch or the out. Be direct and be consistent. So um, the big trick here, guys, is you have to create the biting event. Don't let the dog just come and surprise you and bite you because we'll always get caught off guard. We always lose. If your dog has a real big biting problem, purposely do this, uh, you know, five times a day with your dog, purposely do it. The more frequency you do it, the faster the dog learns what you want, like and don't like. Okay. Um, so we have that. Um, now there are going to be a situation where your dog is just acting ridiculously savage, right? We call this, sometimes it's called crepuscular behavior or your dog is just tired. But crepuscular behavior happens when the sun is coming up. It happens at high noon, sometime in the middle of the day, and it happens as the sun is coming down, right? This happens because dogs evolved from wolves and coyotes. If you guys have ever been camping, wolves and coyotes are the most excited when the sun is coming up and the sun is coming down. That's why you hear the all the time because that's when they're hunting, right? Um, so dogs will kind of get what's called the zoomies, um, or in scientific terms, it's called crepuscular behavior. They get this at dusk, dawn, and high noon, okay? And this is what happens, right? If your dog is in this competitive state of mind where they're just like, oh, I want to play with someone. I want to wrestle. I want to run and zoom around the house. And they start nipping at you. Usually that nipping um, 
it is easier for us to direct the dog to a toy in that circumstance versus trying to calm that dog down far enough uh, where the ouch and the ouches and all that stuff is going to work, right? So in that circumstance, it's better for you to just redirect the dog um, versus uh, versus trying to direct the dog what you want them to do. Okay, so we're going to redirect to a different toy. Uh, that's where you can grab other other toys like a tug toy or a ball, or you can get the busy buddy like this and you can just say, hey, you want to chew on this thing? And put the dog in his puppy pen or his crate and he's going to go ahead and chew on that thing instead. All right. Um, so that's how we're going to work with that. Now, the last two phases of the biting of the biting checklist is the bite elimination. All right. Um, on Friday, guys, on the Facebook Live, we're going to be going over the second phase, which is bite elimination. Um, after you guys have practiced the bite strength checklist, now we're going to work on bite elimination. So we're going to teach the take it and the off commands. Um, and then we're going to do, um, then we're going to teach the dog to hold our hands and release our hands on command. Right. Um, and then little by little, we develop no mouth anytime without permission. Okay. And this is how we completely phase the dog out of that. All right. Now, um, how many of you guys want to see some obedience? Just very, very small obedience for puppies. Anybody? Let's see. I know, I know, uh, <laughs> all right actually before we move on to obedience any questions we have about 10 more minutes here guys i was supposed to wrap this up uh at eight but i'm gonna do this for about 10 more minutes um but uh any questions before we move forward let's see bring it on perfect okay let me go ahead and grab uh, our little baby uh maya from the very very beginning and we'll go ahead and get started on just some very basic obedience concepts um we're going to go over three basic commands. We're going to go over come. We're going to go over sit. We're going to go over down. Um, and then let's see what else she feels like learning right now. So we'll go ahead and try that out. I'll be right back. Give me two seconds, y'all. All righty, y'all. We are back. All right. We got our little baby. What are you doing? What are you doing, you little nugget? So, Maya is three and a half months old. I'm going to go over just some basic training exercises. Um, it's funny, like I, I did obedience. Everyone wants to see obedience. We have more people on now than we did five minutes ago. Um, so just to get, give you guys some idea, um, this is her dinner, actually. So let me show you. Uh, we just took her normal dinner, and we just 
put the kibble and we made it soggy. That's all we did. We just put some hot water in it. Um, a lot of times we want to go to pet stores and we want to get all the fanciest treats. Um, for puppies, puppies are pretty simple. They're pretty hungry and they want to eat everything all the time. So if we just soak their normal kibble, um, you're going to see that it, A, it's more appetizing and B, it's easier for them to chew so that we can feed them another one and then feed them another one and then feed them another one. Okay. So we just soak some kibble. Come here, baby. We just soak some kibble and we're just going to guide you guys through a little bit of priming first. Um, the big key in teaching dogs uh, tricks or obedience with food, uh, we have to go ahead and start with just teaching them uh, how to follow our hands. So right now I have a piece of a treat right here in my hand and I'm just going to follow you a little straight line and give it to her. Now, right before I give it to her, I'm going to say the word yes. So let's see. Yes. Yes. Okay. And maybe I'll do like a straight line and a turn. That was nice. Yes, good girl. And we'll do another straight line. Yes. It's a little bit of a warm up. Right here. Yes, good girl. All right. More of a warm up. Now I'm going to do some, some, some turns. So I'm going to walk around. We're going to do a little spin. Yes, good girl. We're going to go this way, do a little spin this way. Yes. But you see her exuberance for the food, her excitement for the food. This is where, yeah, yep, this is Maya. Um, this is where we want to start. So we're priming her this way. Now, the very, very first thing that we're going to teach, we're just going to teach uh, sit. Okay, so the way that we do that is we're going to draw the dog forward and we're going to bring the food slightly above the dog's head. Now, when the dog is in proper sit position, we're just going to release the food. At this stage, we don't have to say anything. Yes, except the word yes when she does it. Okay, so we're drawing the dog forward come on, and up and sit. Okay, a lot of times the mistake is people will bring the treat way up here. Let me kind of show you real quick. Oh, where are we at? Okay. A lot of times what will happen is people will bring the treat way up here, which leads to jumping a little bit. So you see how the dog jumps? So we don't want the dog to jump. We want to just put it one inch above her head. When her butt hits the ground, we release it. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, called a shaping process. We're just shaping what we want, getting the dog to follow, raising the hand up, giving the dog food. Now, sit is really, really easy. Right? We're literally just raising the dog's head up, the dog's weight falls back on his back on their back end, and the dog sits. Okay. Now, one of the harder ones that we're going to shape is going to be the down. This changes slightly from dog to dog. All right. So actually, before I move on, I'm just going to teach you this. So we put this, put it up, the dog sits. Perfect. Uh, I'm just going to do five rounds in a row. Yes. 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 Good girl. Hi, ma'am. Come on. Yes. Good. All right. So she's picked it up already. Come on. Good. Yes. All right. So just the simple signal of us raising our hand up like this means sit. OK, now, once the dog understands that, I can actually phase the food out altogether. So right now there's no food in my hand. But if I raise it up. Yes, I can give the dog food after the fact. OK, um, so the reason I'm not saying sit at this moment is because at first we want to shape it. Once it's shaped, then what we want to do is we want to then say the word right before we give the signal. So the physical signal is me raising my hand up like this. Good dog. Right. And it's pretty consistent. Yes, good dog. But you see how I'm just raising my hand up and the dog's sitting? I don't necessarily need words right away because dog's first language is body language. Good. Good. All right. Now, we're going to start saying the word next. So we're going to say the word sit right before we raise our hand. So sit. Yes. Just like that. Sit. Yes. Good gear. Oh, you dropped it. Come on, sit. Yes. Good. Come on, sit. Yes. One more time. Sit. Yes. You see how accurate she's being, guys, with the sit? Sit. Yes. This is the difference between good dog training and bad dog training. 
Okay, I'm going to just demonstrate the right technique, the bad technique, and then the wrong technique, and then the good technique again, right? So a lot of times people, the bad dog training technique will be sit, 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 good, good dog. Come here, sit, 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 right? Look what's wrong. My hand's up here. I'm repeating myself four or five times, and then I'm giving the dog to tr the treat. What's happening is we're actually conditioning ourselves to work really hard. So we're conditioning ourselves to say sit, sit, sit five times versus shaping it, sit, and getting an accurate one-time sit every single time. Come here, sit, good, very nice. Come, sit, uh-uh, sit, yes, good. So you see how accurate it is? We follow those steps, we shape it first, we develop a signal, and then we start naming the signal. Sit means this, sit means that, okay? So now we're gonna shape the down for you guys. Pretty easy stuff, but it's so easy, it's easy to do it wrong. All right, so the next thing we're gonna do, we're gonna grab a piece of food, we're gonna get the dog in sit position, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna push downwards toward the dog's feet, so right here between the dog's paws, so that way they can lay down. Come in. And then we're gonna push down between the dog's feet. As soon as the dog's chest hits the ground, we're gonna release the treat. So we're just shaping the down position. Come on, sit. And pushing down towards the dog's chest. That's her butt. Come in. Come in, baby. Come on. Good. And we're just going straight down. Okay. So the dog is just following the hand. So I'm gonna do this five reps and by saying I'm gonna say yes every time the dog does it. So we're gonna go, yes. As soon as the dog is flat, I'm gonna release the treat. Yes. That's two. Come on. Yes. Good. Yes. Good. One more time. I mean, yes. Good dog. Perfect. All right. So going up is for sit. So going up is for sit. Going down to the ground is for down. <laughs> You're so sprightly, mommy. You're like a little fairy. Wait, 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 wait. Okay. So now what we're going to do, we're going to say sit. Raise the hand up. We're going to say down right right before we put our hand to the ground. Down. Good dog. Let's try it again. Go a little further back, a little bit. All right, let's do it. Okay. Sit, sit, down. Yes, good. But I want you guys to notice the delay. Down, sit. Nice, so we did that one in reverse. Down, sit, down, sit. Down, sit. Yeah, perfect. So that's called a puppy push-up sequence where we're getting the dog to do a puppy push-up. It's like a little workout for them. Okay, come in, sit, sit, down, good, sit, come on. Yes, good dog. So we wanna teach our dogs to do puppy push-ups, all right? Um, puppy push-ups, what we're doing is we're asking the dog to do three position changes so that we can do give them one treat, okay? Uh, so in the early stages, we give the dog treats for everything that they do. And as we start progressing in food training, we're going to give the dog treats uh, for doing multiple uh, position changes. So sit, down, sit, yes, good. Come on, sit, down, sit, yes, good girl, good girl. Now, uh, we can train dogs even as young as nine weeks old to eight weeks old to do stuff like this as well, guys. This is pretty simple stuff. Um, sit, down, sit, good. Okay, so this is a puppy push-up sequence. So we want everyone to practice this. Another different, uh, another one we can do is we can do sit to stand. So stand, as soon as the dog's on all four paws, we give the dog food, stand, yes. Sit, stand. Good. As soon as she's on all four legs, we release the treat. Stand. Yes. Sit. Sit. Stand. Yes. Good girl. And all we're doing, we're just doing sit, down, stand. We're just guiding the dog into different positions. Okay. Now, stand is a, a very short version of come. So let me kind of show you. I'm going to get on my knees a little bit. Come on. Come. Come. Good. What we're going to do is we're just going to travel. Maya, come. Come on. Come on. Yes. 
Good girl. Man, come. Yes, good girl. Let's try again. So I'm gonna what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just throw a piece of food so she goes to get it. Check. It's over there. It's over there. Hey, come. Come on. Hey, come. Yes, perfect. And we're just gonna guide the dog to us. I'm gonna stand up when you do it. Come on. Come on. Yes, good girl. Come on, Maya. Oh, the crate's freaking around. Come on, come on Maya. Yes, good girl. All right, so we're just practicing come, we're practicing sit, we're practicing down. These are pretty simple exercises that we can do with our dogs uh, to just teach them positions. So let's try down, sit, stand, sit, down. That was awesome. She did, I think, four or five changes that time for one tree. Come, sit, down, sit, stand, down. Nice. <laughs> so she's killing these combos right now. Now, she definitely had a couple sessions before this, but she was able to do this yesterday and the day before that. So down, sit, down, sit. Good. Okay. So this in and of itself, guys, when we're doing food training or treat training. Hold on. Oh, sorry. Excuse me, baby. Ow, ow, ow. Ah. Okay. Come here. So when we're doing food training or treat training, um, really what we're doing, uh, it's mental stimulation stuff. We're getting our dogs to focus on learning new concepts, learning new things. Oh, here's actually a great example of what we were talking about before. Let's see. Ow! That hurts. Don't do that. You see how she stopped, right? So if I continue to touch her, love on her. Oh, you're a good dog. So see how I'm purposely asking her to chew on my hand? I purposely want her to. Oh my goodness. Okay, get out of here. Get out of here. I got you. I can't, guys. It's too freaking cute. Okay. So, uh, oh, look at that. Look at that. You're so fast. Um, she's so stinky cute, guys. This is getting hard. Um, so we practice the sit, we practice the down, we practice the stand, we practice the come. So four commands in like 10 minutes, right? Um, just to go over those things. So it's pretty, it's pretty easy. It's pretty fun, um, to, to teach our dogs this stuff. And this is the, some of the mental stimulation stuff that we can do with our dogs while we are, um, you know, while, while they're out of their confinement, while they're with us. Um, that's so interesting too. If a dog does obedience, they actually burns out more brain calories than, um, and burned out brain calories means uh, they don't have to do as much physical exercise, right? So if you guys have ever experienced a dog who, you know, um, can, you know, goes to the dog park for 20, 30 minutes and then comes back home, um, and then in 10 minutes is ready to go again. Well, that's a dog who's very physically conditioned, right? When a dog is mentally conditioned and mentally exercised, that dog will actually sleep for two to three hours, right? So we can actually combat a lot of, we have to find a balance between mental and physical stimulation for sure. Okay. Um, let's do some crate stuff. Going back to that crate stuff that we were talking about. Oh yeah. Another one. Get in there. Get in there. Just don't act. This isn't her crate, so we're trying to figure that out. Come baby. One sec. Look in, get inside. Get in there. Good girl. Get all of that food in there. So this is just a new crate to her. She really likes her crate, but this is a new crate to her. But this is some of that warm-up exercise we talked about for some of the dogs. Come on, Maya. Come on. Good girl. And then what we do is we'll close the door. Good girl. And then we'll just open the door again. Maya. What's this? Get in there. Go. Now that she did it already cross the threshold once, it's a lot easier for her to do this. Good girl. Maya, come on. Come on. Let's do it. Come on. Yeah, good. We'll close the door again. Maya, what's this? What is that? Go in there. And so if your dog has a hard time eating food in the crate, this is your warm-up exercise. 
All right, we just practice this about 10, 10 times a day. I just close the door. All I'll do is I'll actually put food in there and I'll close the door just to make her want it more. What is in there? What is in there? And then I'll go ahead and open it. Come by. Come on. In here. Come on, look. In here. What's that? In there. And then she'll go ahead and eat that food. All right, guys. So I'm going to go ahead and open this up for just questions and answers. Um, we'll do this for another 10 minutes. If you guys have any other questions and answers, I really hope that this first uh, this first one workshop was helpful for you guys. Um, hope you were able to get some good information in. Again, if you guys have any questions, call me, email me. Um, my number is 310-737-8311. Uh, we'll go ahead and just put that here in the comments. But go ahead. I'm ready to take your guys' questions, ready to take your guys' answers. Or give you guys answers. You know, baby Maya the Morky. Oh, who loves you? Who loves you? Who loves you so much? All right, Brittany. It should be a requirement that everyone who gets a dog must go to dog training with you. You're so funny. <laughs> You're too sweet. Thank you. I wish you lived closer and not in Las Vegas. Um, very kind of you. Thanks. All right. I just put my puppy in a crate for a little while and he barked away. He looked like he was tired and sleepy, but he perked up and got upset. Sometimes he is okay inside crate, and sometimes he is not. Okay. Um, what times of day do you normally put, or like how many times a day does the dog go into the crate, would you say? Not much. That's why, right? So if we're not putting the dog in to eat, if we're not putting the dog in to chew, to rest, all those things that we talked about earlier in the seminar, um, then it's going to end up becoming uh, it's going to it's going to end up becoming a bad place, right? So the easiest way to teach our dogs to hate the crate, we only put the dog in the crate when they're in trouble, or we only put the dog in the crate when we're leaving. This is the number one way of counter conditioning the crate. So if you're guilty of doing that, we have to practice those other four, five positive ways of crate training uh, to balance it out. And I, uh, so he is all, yeah, if he's not crated anymore, uh, then that's why. That's why he sucks at it, right? Um, I would recommend um, I would recommend to keep at it. And if you guys again, if you guys want to work uh, together, I'm happy to do a free online session when it comes to the crate training uh, to help you guys. It, it is such an important part of development that if we can't master separation um, from us, then the dog is going to continue to have separation anxiety, codependency. Uh, the dog will get stressed just being isolated. Um, you know, it, it just it sets us a bad habit especially right now that we're in COVID-19 lockdown we're spending more time than average with our dogs than we will when we all go back to work so really having a strong schedule where we can put the dog away come back um, you know teach our dogs to be independent that's going to be the most important okay let's see Heather Dowell since we brought our dog home she does not eat in her crate but goes in okay and does not cry is that okay not to feed her meals in there if she is okay she is a rescue okay so always the question is doesn't matter if she's a rescue if she's not eating in her crate then that tells us she's she's nervous right it could be a puppy it could be a rescue it could be you know a doggy it doesn't matter so the idea is if we put the food in and the dog's not eating, my follow-up question would always be how many times have we tried? That's number one, right? If it's less than what you can count on one hand, um, then I would keep trying. If, if you failed multiple times doing this, um, I would maybe jazz up the food 
and I would also, um, again, maybe even try, um, I, I would jazz up the food. Honestly, that'd be the easiest way to do it. So my question for you is, is how many times have you tried feeding the dog in the crate before we threw in the towel? Um, or, or, you know, how is your dog's appetite in general? You mind answering that so people can know? Oh, your mama, my Oh, this is pretty cute. You guys should see this. <laughs> so that's i mean that's that's the common answer i get right that's the common answer i get so uh it's it's uh, a lot of times again dog parenting is one of those things i mean human parenting too it's like we're scared to fuck it up we're so scared to fuck it up that sometimes we won't try something if it even runs the risk of going wrong right so uh that's why dog trainers exist right we are in essence relationship counselors for dogs and their humans now uh, that's what we're supposed to do <laughs> yeah, at least she's honest. <laughs> exactly. Uh, cool. I'll take one more question if you guys have one. Um, but again, feel free to email me, guys. DM me. Um, I'm hungry. I have to get some dinner. But I'm ha I'm I'm happy to wait with you. Wait with you guys and answer questions also. So no rush. Who got a good like? Who has a question that's like? That's like. That's just been bothering them for weeks about their puppy or a week or however long you've had your puppy. You just couldn't get this one thing fixed. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brittany. Mm -hmm. Questions. Any other questions? Because we're going to shut down. At 2.25, we're going to be done. Or two hours and 25 minutes. So if there's no more questions, guys, then I will sign out at two hours and 25 minutes. Maya, we're so happy you came. We are so happy you're here. <gasps> Alrighty, guys, if there are no more questions, then I'm just going to go ahead and wrap up. Again, let me go ahead and give you guys our information. Uh, go ahead and email us. Info at CanisDogTraining.com or follow us on Instagram at Canis Behavior. Check out the website at CanisDogTraining.com. Also, I remember uh, I told you guys uh, we've been doing a podcast now for the last two months. It is called the Dog Trainers Podcast. It is now on Google, uh, iHeartRadio, iTunes, plus four other platforms. I just can't remember their names because I don't use them. Uh, oh, it's on Spotify now too. Also, um, Oh, sorry, Brittany, you have a question. Okay, here we go. Trying to train heel to foster while I'm walking both blue and foster because I'm trying to take both of them out for a walk. Should I just take dogs out for an exercise walk and then foster separately to teach heel? She is, yeah, yes. So, yeah, I would recommend, yeah, it's really hard for you guys to train dogs while you have other dogs distracting them right it's just kind of adding more um 
more variables to the learning process. Like it's like putting the TV on when you're trying to do your homework. It's just an extra distraction. So I would definitely try and shape the heel first before you um, before you put her as part of the pack. So shape it first. And the walk doesn't have to be a long walk, right? You can go up and back and forth, up, up and down the same block over and over and over and over if you want to just teach heel. Um, and then once you've done that, then you can go ahead and add the other dogs. So good question. Um, let's see. Heather says she is still biting after trying the other methods. So we use the can and apple bitters. Is that okay? So apple bitters is, is not necessarily going to work the way you think. Um, to be realistic, Heather, I think I only met with you like three days ago. So the other methods may not have been practiced as much as they should be. Uh, but I believe she's older, right? If she's older than four months, the, those methods may not work, right? The window for teaching dogs um, certain things ch change. So if you'd like, maybe we have to do an online online session, um, and I actually teach you how to how to deal with the in incidents of biting, right? Because I think the the window of uh, the pressure bite work, or the teaching the dog the, the strength of their bite that closes around 18 weeks old. So we can't do it anymore with the ouches and the bites and stuff like that. Um, let's see, bitter apple and Rachel. <laughs> Rachel says I rock. Tell Rachel I said thank you. <laughs> um, bitter, yeah, bitter apples. Um, here's the interesting thing with bitter apple. Bitter apple is usually uh, taught in a funny way or taught in a wrong way. Uh, this is the way that I've been taught and I've seen that it works tremendously. A lot of times people will just spray things. The problem is, is that the bitter taste goes away after a while um, because the chemicals that make it bitter will fade out over time. Uh, but the smell of apples will, will resonate for longer periods of time. So the, the scent of apples will still be there, but sometimes the bitterness goes away really quickly. Um, so what, what usually when, when you're going to use it uh, properly, um, what I like to do is I'll, I'll, you know, I'll spray onto my fingers, let my dog smell the fingers, and then I'll shove the bitterness back into their mouth. Okay, what we're trying to do is we're trying to have a class, um, uh, a conditioning, a pairing happen from the scent of the apples usually tastes like shit. Right. And if we can develop that, then uh, the dog will kind of have a memory of that smell tasting like shit. But remember, the reason that your dog is biting on your hands is not because they want to eat your hands or, or anything like that. The reason they're biting on your hands is because they're trying to play with you. And so your dog is learning that the, re you know, gnawing on you and biting you and doing all that stuff is a way to get some type of attention, even if it is negative attention. All right. All right, guys. So that's the last question I'm going to answer. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Go ahead and join us on Facebook Live. Uh, we're going to be doing a couple of extensions of this type of stuff um, there, uh, plus a little bit of uh, other things that we're going to have new people checking in. Um, but we will be saving some of the second uh, tier of this type of stuff, more obedience, uh, more chew training, uh, more crate training, all that stuff. We're going to talk about a couple of the next levels of that type of work. Uh, we really appreciate you guys for sticking around with us. All 10 of you guys who are still here for two and a half hours. That's nuts. I don't even think I would listen to myself that long, but I really appreciate you guys sticking around and taking this knowledge. Um, this, this particular video will be available to rewatch on our YouTube channel. So just because it's live doesn't mean it's going to go away like on Instagram. You guys can watch this, rewatch this, watch it again, watch it again if you want to. Uh, share it with a friend if you think that some of the stuff in here was helpful. Um, and uh, that'd be awesome, right? We want to help as many of these Corona puppies as possible um, because uh, the key to really having a good dog is really making sure they have a good childhood. All right. Um, all right, guys, we love you all. Um, and we'll talk to you guys later. All right. Peace.